<laughs> Welcome everyone to Rising with the Tide, keeping our communities above water. I'm Anastasia Fisher, president of U.S. Harbors, and I'm honored to be your host today. We're thrilled that you could join us. Um, and um, we are so excited for you to learn about and discuss this really important topic of rising coastal water levels, something that is already and will be increasingly impacting all of us who live and work on the coast. For the past several years, our team at U.S. Harbors has been steadily getting more and more questions about a localized high tide flooding, planning for sea level rise, understanding and measuring wa local water levels, a myriad of things for which we haven't had great answers. So in response to the obvious interest on this subject and coinciding with our project to help coastal communities get access to affordable tide monitoring solutions, we've pulled together this amazing group of presenters that you're going to meet today. They're here to share the facts and the myths about water levels and models for coastal risk assessment and adaptation. We're gonna to start today with a wide angled macro view with John Englander speaking on sea level rise. Then we'll move into more specifics with Renee Collini speaking about the changing coastal shoreline and her work with community adaptation. And finally, David Walcott from NOAA will speak about the details of tide monitoring and the future of tide predictions. We're also gonna have two short breakout sessions, one on community engagement with Gail Bonus from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute and Joseph Sukawi from New York City's Waterfront Alliance. And finally, we'll wrap up the conference with a short session about new technologies for tide monitoring with Brian Glazier from Hohonu and Heiku Udluf from Divirod. These great solutions now make it possible for communities to monitor their own local water level. Before we start, I also want to do, uh, introduce Alicia Biggert. Uh, Alicia is our content manager here at U.S. Harbors. Alicia will be fielding your questions via the question and answer window at the bottom of the Zoom viewer. You can upvote questions that you see here. If someone has already asked a similar question to yours, um, just upvote it and that will give this question priority. Um, some of today's presenters will be answering questions during their presentations, while others are going to take questions after. So that for, for the presenters that are answering questions during their session, we'll ask you to please uh, use the raise your hand icon in the bottom of the Zoom window, and we'll do our best to get you into the dialogue. If by any chance we're not able to get your question answered uh, today's session, don't worry. Alicia will be pulling together a document with all the participants submitted questions answered by the presenters, and we'll be distributing that to you via email at the end of this week. Um, our general chat window is also open. We invite you to introduce yourself, but ask you to please honor everyone's time and well being by staying polite and civil. We're all here for the shared reason that we care about the safe future for our communities. So with no further ado, we are more than grateful to have a message from Senator Angus King from our great state of Maine. And um, we are going to kick off and he's gonna give us a quick message. So bear with me while I stumble around with my Zoom controls. I'm delighted to have a few moments today to join US Harbors in your conference on rising sea level, rising tides. Uh, this could not be more timely or important. I want to congratulate you on coming together to think about and share best practices and ideas for dealing with what is an inevitable challenge uh, all over the United States, all over our uh, coastal United States. I understand my friend John Englander is there. Uh, he'll be giving you some uh, great information, I'm sure. He and I have worked together in the past on these issues. But let me just share that the infrastructure bill that was just signed this week has in it uh, resiliency funds to deal with helping communities to prepare for uh, these kinds of issues rather than simply cope with them after the disaster strikes. And I think that's an important initiative. It's something I've been working on uh, for some time. Uh, preparation, you know, what is the old ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That certainly applies in this case. And the, there's, you know, the, the inevitability of rising sea level is really uh, upon us. Uh, just this week in Maine, there was an article about sunny day flooding uh, in Portland. Uh, areas that have occasionally flooded at a king tide are now flooding much more frequently. 
And this is going to start happening. It's already happening in Miami. It's going to be happening on, in all of our coastal states. So I want to thank U.S. Harbors for the work that you have done and that you do do for uh, communities across the country, but also particularly for focusing on this important issue. Coming together like this is incredibly important. Abraham Lincoln was once asked what he would do if he was told he had to split a cord of wood in an hour. And his response was, I spend the first 15 minutes sharpening my ax. Most of us would just commence chopping. But what you're doing now is sharpening the ax. You're thinking, you're sharing ideas, you're gaining insights from your colleagues. And that's what we really have to be putting the emphasis on as we move into what are literally uncharted waters. Thank you for the work that you're doing. I look forward to hearing about the results of the conference. And please, please uh, share the ideas, uh, be as, as uh, foreseeing as you can possibly be, because this is a challenge that we all must face together. Thanks again, and congratulations. <laughs> that was a great uh, message from Senator King. We are so proud to have him as our Senator here in Maine. And uh, we want to also thank him for his time and especially for his ongoing concern and focus on the critical issues that we in our coastal states are facing um, with the rising water levels. Also, we want to thank him for providing a wonderful segue. Uh, Senator King took our next presenter, John Englander, to Greenland several years ago to help explain the complexities of sea level rise to the head of the U.S. Coast Guard. John is a highly regarded expert on this topic, an oceanographer and international speaker, as well as a former head of the Cousteau Society. John has two wonderful best-selling books. Both we are really highly recommended. Uh, I've read them both, so I, I'm telling you, I, they're really highly recommended. Um, High Tide on Main Street, which showed how sea level rise will happen more quickly than most of us think, and his recently released book, Moving to Higher Ground, which updates the timetable in his first book and then addresses real solutions for coastal residents and infrastructure. Also, in honor of this conference, U.S. Har Harbors is offering 20% off special signed editions to Moving to Higher Ground between now and November 28th. And Alicia will be putting a link in the chat box for those of you who want to take advantage of this offer. And now with great excitement, it's a treat to welcome John Englander. Please note that John will be taking questions after his presentation, but definitely feel free to ask them through that question and answer window so Alicia can connect them. Hey, John, uh, take it away. Great, Anastasia, this is great. Um, let me make sure I get the share screen here. Oops. Oh, you need me to you give you to any- enable. Yep. yep, there you go. All right, let's try it again. You got it? Um, I think so. Try this. Da, da, da. There, did that work? Absolutely. OK, great. Well, this is exciting. And I can tell already from the way you've orchestrated this, Anastasia that, uh, and Alicia, that um, this is really an innovative seminar. seminar and um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. And um, I'm doing this from Puerto Rico, where I'm here doing a presentation later this afternoon. I gave a workshop this morning in Sweden, thanks to the wonders of Zoom technology. Um, this is a global issue, but certainly Maine and the coastal United States and the harbors are kind of front and center. And uh, it was great to have Senator King do that nice kickoff. So um, let's just dig in. We wanna cover water level for US harbors. And in the simplest level, it, we have to think of sea level plus weather phenomenon like storms and plus tides. And then of course, all the other things that uh, your co-presenters here are gonna delve into much much better in the, in the next segments. To keep this really simple and, and top level is, the first question is why is sea level rise unstoppable and unpredictable? And I want to make sure that everybody comes away from this understanding that because it's surprising. There's a lot of misinformation out there. We should also clarify what the latest IPCC projections are and even the uh, what's called the COP26 meeting that just ended in, in, uh, in Glasgow, Scotland a few days ago. And I'm sure you've heard about that, but there may be some confusion. So I'm gonna bring that in since it's very current. I wanna try and clear up the difference between flooding and erosion and sea level rise. 
which all seem to get lumped together in, in the same bucket and adding to confusion. And then, as you say, I will try to answer questions. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave this at about uh, a half hour into the next segment, but I am going to watch the rest of this this evening. I'm already fascinated to see what the rest of the presenters do, and including the breakout sessions. You've just got a great program here, but any questions that I answer live will have to be uh, following my, my talk. Um, let's start with the news. The, uh, I wrote a blog post uh, today, and it's on my website, johnenglander.net, but simply I point out that this COP meeting, the Council Conference of the Parties that meets every year, this is the 26th time they've been doing that, met in, uh, in Glasgow, uh, and the scientific aspect of that same UN effort, kind of the findings came out in August, and that was the sixth time. They do that every six or eight years. And this is the, the simple takeaway is that relate to, to um, the benchmarks of where we're at. The planet has already warmed 1.2 degrees Celsius, which is about 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit, since we began burning fossil fuels. And it's now beyond any dispute. All 196 nations at that conference last week agreed that it's because of burning fossil fuels, particularly coal. There's no doubt about that anymore. There's near unanimous agreement. They agreed the goal should be to stop the warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, that's compared, I know Americans don't do Celsius very well, but there, you have some people outside the United States on this. And uh, just from a comparative standpoint, if we're already at 1.2 degrees and we're saying we should try and keep the warming to 1.5 degrees, that's a 20% increase in the warming we've already had. So let's be realistic. The kind of things that are happening today, um, more warming, more wildfires, more droughts, heavier rainfall, all relate to a warming ocean, a warming planet. And what the latest findings as of Saturday were that we should try to limit the warming to a 20% further increase in warming. So again, without getting technical, warming is in our future and the effects of warming and as it relates to sea level and flooding in our communities. It's also finally worth noting that at all the proposals are put on the table after two weeks of discussions in Scotland, that they came up saying that the best week that, that on, the, on the current path um, or current with the current proposals, we're gonna get double the warming we've had now. So we've had 1.2 degrees, again, I'm sorry, it's Celsius, but that's what the world does. It's 2.2 Fahrenheit. They wanna try and keep it to 20% more than that, but the proposals on the table double the warming. So that's the background. Coastal flooding comes from several things and it's easy to confuse them when we just think of flooding, but I like to break it down to storms, which we all know what that is. And, and uh, whether it be a nor'easter in Maine or a hurricane in Florida where I live or the Caribbean where I am today, but we know what storms are. Then we're getting rainfall, record breaking rainfall every year. And it's not just on the coast. We're getting it from Germany to the middle of India to the middle of the United States to uh, central China. Rainfall is breaking records because a warmer ocean evaporates more and that moisture in the air comes down as rain or snow. Rain might be six inches in a location, but it goes downhill and it could turn into 12 inches or 20 inches as runoff. That's important to distinguish. Then we have extreme tides. And I think we're gonna hear some more better information about tides uh, from, uh, from David this afternoon. And then there's rising sea level, which is different than the other four items. And finally, often erosion is combined in as a flooding factor, understandably, but misleading. Uh, the causes of flooding are the first five. I mean, you can get a super extreme events like tsunamis, but we'll keep that out of the picture for today. And, uh, but then realize that often people confuse erosion with rising water level. So let's start with some basics. Um, Melting icebergs are like ice cubes in a glass. And most people assume that melting icebergs add to sea level, but they don't. And the example that I like to use is that just like ice cubes in a glass, if the ice is floating 
as it melts, the water level won't change. And you can run that experiment at home. It's because ice has, water has a peculiar property that just before it freezes, it gets, it, it expands in volume. It becomes a little less dense. That's why it floats about 10% above the surface. But as the ice melts, the water basically compacts again. So that's why melting floating ice has no effect on the water level. Quite counterintuitive though. And it just sets the stage for what does cause sea level to rise. And we'll talk about that, which is the ice on land. Shown here is a glacier coming down from an ice sheet that's out of sight actually behind those mountain ridges. But glaciers are ice on land, so glaciers and ice sheets. And there's two ways that ice on land, whether it's in the form of a glacier or not, adds to sea level. When that front of that glacier calves off into a new iceberg, when it breaks off and a big new chunk of ice enters the sea, that's like adding another ice cube to our glass of water. So that definitely adds to, to the water level. Also, as that ice on land melts and turns into water and works its way to the sea, that adds to sea level in principle, just like adding water to our glass. So the two major causes of sea level rise globally are ice from land entering the sea and melt water from melting ice on land entering the sea. And the third thing, is thermal expansion of seawater. As the oceans warm, they very slightly expand in, in volume. So those are the three reasons for global sea level change. Now, locally, there's subsidence and uplift. Land can move up or down, which will have a ampli uh, an additive or subtractive effect. But to keep it simple, global sea level changes because ice on land melts, ice on land enters the water, and thermal expansion of seawater. That's about all the science you really need to know. Looking back in geologic history, we get the sense of why this is such a big deal and why we've been so ignorant as a society. Looking back at the last ice age, which is about 20,000 years ago is the peak. And I'm gonna show you a few views of this, but this is the simplest uh, depiction. Looking at this cross section of the blue is the water, the ocean, if you will. 20,000 years ago, sea level was 390 feet. That's 120 meters for those who do like metric lower, and it rose as the ice sheets melted, what we call the ice age, the, glacier, the ice sheets that covered most of the Northern hemisphere. And sea level rose an amazing 390 feet in about 15,000 years. It got to the present level about 6,000 years ago, which is pretty much when our written records and civilization began. So throughout human civilization, sea level hasn't changed much. But what's interesting is that not only did, has it been fairly stable for 6,000 years, but the rate of rise just 11,000 years ago was picking up at the rate of 15 feet a century, over a foot a decade. And this isn't a storm surge. This isn't rainfall. This isn't erosion. This is higher ocean level. Imagine that, climbing the coastline. We just had no awareness because it had been stable for 6,000 years. Okay, if we look at sea level since we had tide gauge records, which started in about 1850, it's been rising pretty steadily. Now the moving up and down in a wavy line, but the trend is quite clear in 170 years. Sea level has risen um, over a foot. It's the rate of rise though that should concern us and the satellite data showing here in the upper right where there's a red line, and I'm now gonna expand that area of data. We, our first satellites that could measure sea level precisely globally uh, were put up in 1992. And so starting in 1993, we have a precise, consistent radar altimetry measurement of sea level all around the planet with a consistent uh, technology. And that's new. And in that time, we noticed that sea level just keeps rising. But if you look at this carefully, at the first segment, it was kind of still the trail end of the last century when sea level was rising about a millimeter and a half. That's like a 20th of an inch, not much. But then while we've been measuring this daily sea level, the rates doubled to over 3.2 millimeters a year. 
That's about an eighth of an inch. But in the last decade, it's almost five millimeters a year. Now the pandemic has taught us something. The pandemic, COVID-19, which we're all paying attention to. Changes in rate and changes in direction can have an amazing compound effect. Particularly if they get to exponential growth. Now this change from 1.5 to 3.2 to five is not exponential growth yet, but looks to me like it's the path. And again, just like the pandemic, you have to be careful extrapolating to the future, but you also need to step back and see what are the trends going on here? Because at five millimeters a year, that's about a quarter of an inch. That's not too important. But if you keep doubling that, you'd be surprised at what that gets to. Many feet this century. And I explained that in my book. I don't want to get too detailed here. This is the big picture of sea level, carbon dioxide, and global temperature. And I, at the stage, as we've talked about, this is the first graph in my book. And uh, it's on my website for free. But let me talk it through because it, it has a lot of information in it. And it explains what part of climate change is natural and why we're in new territory. This is 400,000 years. The green line is carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. The red is global average temperature and the blue is sea level. I've made this about as simple as I can so that it has a wide audience. This was done with the help of a famous climate scientist, Dr. James Hansen, one of, one of the global leaders, a former NASA chief scientist. So let's just talk through this. It'll only take me a couple of minutes and I can make it very simple. The red line moving up and down over 400,000 years shows the ice ages. The ice ages are the cold spots, if you will. The difference in global temperature between an ice age and now, the warm era, is five degrees Celsius or nine Fahrenheit. So let's stick with Fahrenheit, knowing this is mostly a US audience. You can see that there's a repeating pattern of cold to warm, and the period is pretty much the same. It's about 100,000 years. And this, the temperature rises pretty quickly, 20,000 years roughly, and then falls for 80,000 years. We are at the warm spot at the end of the right-hand side of that red line compared to the last ice age 20,000 years ago, the, the low point there. I think I can maybe even do this with my cursor. This has been a natural pattern. It's described as something called the Milankovitch cycle. It's, a, it's the combination of the changing elliptical orbit of the Earth around the sun, the tilt and the wobble. Those three things combine and they effectively become a super summer winter. That's what an ice age is. That's a really simple way of describing it. But just like summer and winter because of more, more or less heat, that's the ice age cycles. They've been happening for 2.58 million years. That's how long we've had these natural, every roughly 100,000 year ice age cycles. Those were natural. Now, as the planet gets warmer, the ice melts. And as the planet gets colder, the ice sheets grow. That makes sense. So sea level, the blue line follows the red line. The confusing part is why does carbon dioxide and the red line follow each other and which one's in control? And although this sounds surprising, either one can be in control. The red and green lines will go together over time, over centuries. And either one can change for different reasons. And the other will follow due to some different principles of physics that I explained, but I think it's beyond what we should do today in this kind of overview. But I can give it to you very simply. It was proven in 1859 and demonstrated publicly, but it's an easy experiment. Again, you can run, you can do it in your home. That carbon dioxide, even though it's 100% clear, obviously it's invisible as a gas, it traps heat. And we were warned in 1859 by Professor John Tyndall in London in a demonstration that more carbon dioxide from burning coal and other fossil fuels would put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And there was concern back then that this could lead to global warming. And over the decades, that's been reinforced by lots of scientists in lots of places. It's again, it's something very simple. You can actually do it 
with a thermometer and a light bulb and, and a, a tank of carbon dioxide, but um, very simple physics. So that's why when um, carbon dioxide is higher, as we're making it higher, and um, that it traps more heat. Now, as you can see, the normal bounds of carbon dioxide go from about 180 parts per million up to about 280 parts per million, just round figures. We're now over 415, 40% higher. And because carbon dioxide traps heat, the world is warming. We're, we should be entering the natural cooling cycle by our red line, but in fact, we're, we've, so let me see if I can move the cursor here. Right there, you can see we've, we probably were entering the cooling period about 100 years ago, but because we keep adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, now we're on a new uptick and it's going up faster and faster. And as the world gets warmer, the ice melts in Greenland and Antarctica, as we're gonna see in a moment, and that raises sea level. So the confusing part is why does the natural change of global temperature, what we think of as the ice age cycles, um, why did that correlate with carbon dioxide long before we were burning fossil fuels? 400,000 years as shown here. And the reason is that as the oceans warm, they release carbon dioxide. That's a different principle of physics, but equally simple and provable. Um, so when the world is warmer by these natural cycles, we think of as the ice ages due to the changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun, basically. When the planet's warmer, the oceans give off carbon dioxide. When the oceans get colder, they absorb more carbon dioxide. That's why temperature drives carbon dioxide. When carbon dioxide changes level, as we are doing now by burning fossil fuels, it traps more heat like a greenhouse effect, like a clear sheet of glass in a greenhouse. So this chart shows a natural pattern of changing sea level in, a, in aligned with changing global temperature and carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And the, this pattern of 400,000 years actually extends to the left two and a half million years, almost identical. The breakout is carbon dioxide due to our burning fossil fuels that were stuck in the ground as coal or petroleum. So that's a picture that you're welcome to use. Uh, again, it's on my website, but if you do get my book, there's even instructions in the book on how to download this. And I hope people use it because a lot of even uh, scientists use this diagram now because it's relatively non-technical and paints a rather clear picture. Let's talk about the cause of sea level from a practical standpoint. Where is this ice? It's in two places. It's Antarctica and Greenland. And um, we, we may know that, but it's, I think it's nice to see them here physically. And you can probably see it on the backdrop in front of, or behind me, in fact, above me is Greenland. And of course, Antarctica is there at the bottom, but here's just a depiction of those two ice sheets to see their relative size. Antarctica is bigger than North America. Greenland is about the same size as the Eastern United States. They're mind boggling in size. They're covered by two miles of ice, about three kilometers straight up of an ice sheet. They adjust to global temperature change over decades and centuries. And that's what's happening now. As Senator King mentioned and as Anastasia um, mentioned, uh, I had the privilege to accompany Senator King and Admiral Paul Sukumft who was then commandant of the US Coast Guard to Greenland to kind of help pull this story together. Obviously the Coast Guard has interest in it as uh, the commandant was quick to point out, it was the sinking of the Titanic that came from an iceberg in Greenland that uh, reminds us of the uh, importance of to shipping safety and transportation and um, safety at sea, but how even Coast Guard today still monitors the migration of icebergs. And what's happening today is as Greenland melts under warmer temperature, more giant icebergs are liberated and set afloat and those become shipping hazards. So ironically, in a warming world, 
we're getting more giant icebergs calving just as the Arctic sea ice is disappearing and more and more ships are going across the North Pole or the polar ice cap or the polar ocean, the Arctic Ocean to cut shipping time. So we have uh, another problem brewing, which is that more icebergs are occurring in this era of warming. And uh, you know, here's an example of a small ship uh, near some of the large icebergs coming out of a place called Ilulisat in Greenland. And that's where we were, I guess it was five years ago. Um, I try and make this simple for broad audiences. And many of you are interested in, as fishermen or harbor masters or people with one interest or another in US harbors and the states of tide and flooding. And again, in, in this exciting program that US harbors has put together, you're gonna get the three aspects of this. Sea level, the weather impacts, and what does that mean for planning um, and uh, safe navigation? and then the ocean issues like, uh, and, and tide states. But to kind of wrap this up and then certainly answer questions, which invariably seem to follow my presentations and I love clarifying things for people. But the, what I call salty truths are that rising seas and shifting shorelines, that's not temporarily um, erosion, that's permanent changes in shorelines as the seas rise are now unstoppable because we've warmed the planet. And we have to um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the GHG like carbon dioxide, and also start dealing with methane releases, which are even more potent. But regardless of doing that, we have to face the fact that the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica are going to get smaller. It's as simple as a warmer planet has less ice. Now melting the ice does take up some of the energy and help to balance things out, balance things out again. But rising seas and changing shorelines are part of our future. Every inch of rising sea level will make short-term flooding worse. In other words, we've, we've always measured things from sea level. Property or dock height is so many feet and inches above sea level. Something underwater my field used to be uh, very much in the diving realm. Um, and of course we measure our depth below sea level. Something could be 56 feet below sea level. Well, that all suggested that sea level was a static line. And for practical purposes, it was fairly static over the course of a decade or a lifespan. But now with Antarctica and Greenland melting faster and faster, sea level is changing. And that's causing lots of confusion because normally a, a, a benchmark line or a datum, as a, an engineer would call it, if you measure from sea level, you'd think that the, that reference point is not gonna change. Well, what happens when the reference point that is the most common reference point on our planet, height above sea level or distance below sea level, what happens when sea level is moving? It, adds, it causes great confusion, but when sea level is a foot higher, 12 inches higher than present, it means that when a storm, a hurricane, a nor'easter, or a super high tide, a sunny day flooding event, is going to reach even higher because the base sea level is higher. So in other words, when Hurricane Sandy came through 10 years ago, nine years ago, 2012, and it brought an 11 foot abnormal water level to New York City. If sea level was three feet higher by then, if this happened 50 years from now, that 11 feet of storm surge added a three feet of sea level rise would bring the water level 14 feet high. So sea level creates the base level. And then on top of that, we have flooding from storms, rain, downhill runoff, and where the tide state is at. So that's why rising sea level is an amplifier to short-term flooding. But the difference is that sea level is like a drip filling the bucket. It's inexorable and slow and even hard to see, but like a drip filling the bucket, you know, overnight you'll see the tub uh, overflowing or the bucket or the, the rain barrel, whatever it is. 
uh, as or catching you know a leaky roof, uh, that a drip filling the bucket may not seem to have an effect in any given drip, but it's the cumulative effect, and that's the problem with sea level rise as Antarctica and Greenland melt. We don't see the effect on a daily or yearly basis, but it is changing the, the baseline. It's impossible to predict sea level rise precisely because we have two or three miles of ice on Greenland and Antarctica. If they all melted, sea level will be 212 feet higher. That's amazing, permanently higher until the planet got cold enough for the ice to reform and which would take thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. So sea level rise is effectively permanent. But my uh, kind of approximation to consider is that if we just melt 5% of the ice on the planet, just 5% of what's on Greenland and Antarctica, that's 10 feet of sea level rise, three meters. That's a pretty good planning horizon for anybody who's designing something that's gonna be on the coastline, in my opinion. Uh, some places like, and some projects like a nuclear power plant or uh, certain things that have great lifespan and sensitivity to flooding or the cooling systems probably should think of more. But just starting with uh, about 10 feet over the next 100 years is a reasonable uh, horizon or perspective for what could happen with sea level rise. It depends on how warm we would get the planet, uh, let the planet become which depends on whether we burn all the coal or not. So there's a lot of complicating factors about why we can't predict sea level rise precisely long in advance. Finally, I think the, the, one of the questions that I get most often after my talks is, you know, how long do I have with this piece of property before it's, it's underwater? It turns out that's really the wrong question because as sea level rises, and as storms get stronger and heavier rainfall and runoff combined with these extreme high tides, the flooding's getting higher and higher, both the temporary flooding during a flood event and base sea level. Well, if you have something near the coastline and um, a property, whether it be a house or a business or a store or just some uh, vacation property, or infrastructure like a water treatment plant or a ferry dock, whatever it is, a shipping port. Um, as the water level gets closer to your property, or even if it floods three days a year instead of last year, it flooded one day a year, it's, it's the direction uh, of the water height that's gonna affect your property value. In other words, let's say you had land that was 10 feet above sea level. And the storm brought the, you know, the water level to eight feet above sea level. Well, there's only a two foot freeboard there between your property and the peak water level. But as sea level drips higher and higher as Antarctica and Greenland melt more and more, as the water gets closer to your property, the value is being affected. In other words, when it's obvious that the flooding is getting worse and worse, and this is happening in many places already, people are concerned about the price of the property and uh, values are already dropping. So I like to say that property values and flooding happen at, at three stages. When the, when the land is underwater permanently, of course, there has no value. But even if the property floods 10 days a year versus it used to flood one day a year, the value is impacted tremendously already. But even before the water level hits your property, your values are being affected because everybody's aware that the flood levels are increasing with each king tide, with each peak high tide. So that's why properties go underwater permanently, more frequently, and they go underwater in value even before the water arrives, because as the water is getting closer and closer to your property, its value is already being discounted. Nobody's gonna pay much for property that's two inches above sea level. I hope that makes sense. This can be depressing and it's certainly disturbing. And I, I understand that I 
talked to lots of different audiences from the public to engineers, architects, um, military. And uh, at a human level, it's a disturbing concept. But the fact is, let's be honest, that most of us didn't realize that sea level went up and down 400 feet by nature. That's geologic history. So let's start getting educated. Let's acknowledge that if we'd been born 11,000 years ago, sea level would have been rising a foot a decade by nature. But now we're causing it to happen because they're burning fossil fuels. So I think there's three fairly simple takeaways. We have to slow the warming as much as possible or this is gonna get out of control and catastrophic. Two is we have to be designed for more resiliency, whether that be flooding events or wildfires or high temperatures or too much rainfall. We have to be more resilient to this changing world that we can't get back to what we thought of as normal very quickly. And the third thing is we have to begin designing for the future, particularly sea level rise. That requires adaptation. So I like to think that the climate change problem is really three problems. Sustainability, which is how to make our energy without making the planet warmer. Resiliency, which is designing for things that can happen in the next 12 months. And that's not sea level rise. Sea level can't be more than an inch higher in the next 12 months. And then adapting in advance for rising sea level which will be much higher in the coming century. Um, we, have no, we have time to adapt, but we really have no time to waste. This isn't the kind of thing we can leave to our kids and grandkids because the buildings and infrastructure that we design today will be here 100 years from now. So we can't wait for precise data about when the sea will rise, that would be foolish. We uh, can't leave it to our kids and grandkids to redesign the world because we're benefiting from the infrastructure and communities that were built by our parents and grandparents and great grandparents. We're benefiting from, you know, as they say, the trees and the wells, the water wells that were done by prior generations. We have to take that same attitude. We have to deal with slowing the warming, preparing for flood events that can happen in the next year and designing for future sea level, which is gonna be one of our biggest challenges. So I really appreciate US Harbors taking this exciting seminar webinar to such a diverse audience of three or 400 people. It's fantastic. And um, uh, I, I will watch the rest of this webinar this evening. But uh, in, the, in a few minutes here, I'd be glad to take any questions if I can figure out where to find them. Okay. John, if I could just quickly interject, I have a couple of questions for you, um, sure. just briefly. Um, you kept referring to coal, and we just want to confirm that you're talking about all fossil fuels, or is it coal in particular is, you know, an added danger? Sure. So it, it's all, it's both. It's all fossil fuels, which liberate carbon dioxide as they're burned, but coal is um, proportionally the biggest uh, generator. In other words, coal, because of its structure, is uh, has more carbon dioxide per BTU. So uh, it, it is coal, but it is all fossil fuels. Okay. Um, and then I just have one more quick question from Barry Wright. Um, in terms of your worst greenhouse gas fears, you know, what, what are your, what's your worst scenario? Why haven't we fixed it? What can sure. we do? You know, I know this is a bit um, sort of broad, but if you can sort of speak to that. No, sure. It's a, it's a, it's a fair question. Um, there's two levels of fears. One is that we're not going to aggressively work to get off fossil fuels because we aren't. Um, there is no evidence, you know, we can get excited by electric cars and solar panels, but we're still putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere every year. Even the brief slowdown due to COVID, we're already coming back out of that. And um, so we, we really got to, any, any illusion that we're getting off fossil fuels is just that, it's an illusion, first of all. We need to work harder at that. But my other fear is the one thing that we have little control over is methane. We have some control. It's, it, methane is basically natural gas. 
And with the greater use of natural gas, more of it seeps into the atmosphere. And methane is 86 times more potent and uh, per unit than carbon dioxide in trapping heat. But the big problem, the thing that sort of keeps me up at night once in a while, is the methane release that comes from the permafrost, from the seabed, from the Siberian traps that um, where there have been me methane, um, we jokingly call it mega farts, where uh, the earth belches out methane as it warms. And uh, we have little control of that. And, and again, methane could cause a fairly rapid warming. I hope, I, we just have to hope that doesn't happen. But the way that our, our control point is trying to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the air, because that has a direct heat causing effect and that's what's causing methane to be liberated. So while the, uh, the really scary phenomenon is methane, the thing that we should put our efforts into is reducing the carbon dioxide emissions as fast as possible. Cool, thank you. Sure. I think there's another question here. I'm looking at the Q&A. It says, um, uh, Jeff Wickham says, uh, you said that sea level rise is inevitable. Can you please comment on how much of the rise you think we can influence? Well, in the short term, in the next 30 years, most of it's baked in already. I mean, if we just burnt all the coal we could, it will accelerate it, and that would be stupid and bad. Um, but this is kind of a long-term scenario. There's a, there's a slow response from warming the planet to melting the glaciers and ice sheets to raising sea level. It's like stopping a super tanker, as we, you know, I'm sure we've all made that metaphor that you can't stop a super tanker or a ship or even a, a truck for that matter, you know, instantly. There's momentum and, and it takes some time to change speed and direction. And um, there's enough excess heat in the ocean and the rate of Antarctica and Greenland melting is accelerating. That's, there's no doubt about that as we showed in some of those graphs just now that um, we can't stop the rising sea soon. We can slow the rate. And if we don't do the right thing, the rate's gonna accelerate. So I hope that answers that. There's a question here, do I know about Charleston? Well, Charleston, it, I, use, I use Charleston as an example of my book actually, Moving to Higher Ground. I use a hypothetical example there. Charleston has great vulnerabilities. It's part of the low-lying South. They call them the, the, low, the low country in, uh, in South Carolina. But it reminds us that when we think Miami is vulnerable, and it is, or Fort Lauderdale, or Jacksonville, or Tampa, it's Houston, it's Charleston, it's Savannah, it's Baltimore, it's Annapolis, it's Portland, it's Boston, it's Vancouver, it's every coastal city. We don't think of it, but there's 140 nations that border the ocean. And in those 140 nations, there are thousands of communities from the giants of Shanghai and Calcutta and Jakarta to the small towns of, um, of Brunswick, Maine, where Senator King is from, or uh, uh, Boca Raton, where I happen to live in Florida, but as I said, Tampa, Sarasota, uh, Every coastal community is vulnerable to flooding and sea level rise. Charleston is certainly one of them, and it, it, it has high vulnerability, but it's just one of thousands. Anything else? I'm not getting there, Anastasia? Yeah, oh, should, there was, was a question. There was a question struggle. about uh, carbon recapture. I don't know if you send that. Um, uh, John Beale from Belfast, Maine, I assume that's John. Hi, John. Um, has a question about what you think about carbon recapture. Sure, yeah, carbon capture and sequestration, sometimes abbreviated. Um, it's one of the kinds of geoengineering we're gonna try and, and is being experimented. It's reasonable to try it at this point. We've gotta, we've gotta throw everything we've got to slow the warming at this point trying to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere is uh, really challenging because it's so diffuse. It's only a few parts per million, but there are some interesting experiments, but the challenge will be to make them energy efficient because it takes energy to operate those systems to take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And it's the energy production that's causing the problem in the first place. 
So while there are plants in Iceland where they use geothermal en energy rather than uh, fossil fuel based energy to do this, and they're promising, but the cost effectiveness and scalability is um, still lacking. So I think we need to try everything possible to slow the warming, but we shouldn't kid ourselves into thinking that some big machine is gonna suck the CO2 out of the air sufficiently to, to take, make the problem go away. That's just not realistic. And John, do you have any um, examples of places where you feel that the mapping techniques, I know we, uh, Renee might show us one later, but th is there anything that you feel would show us accurately where what the sea level rise projections for our specific locations might be? We've had some questions about, you know, what are the sea level rise predictions for Cape Cod or, you know, Fort Falcon? No. I think Renee is gonna to probably touch on that with much more knowledge than I have. The thing I would say at a simple level is even thinking out 30 years, even if we had a foot of sea level rise, which would be a lot, okay? In fact, it'd be huge as it accelerates. But the more practical problem of flooding comes from the combination of sea level plus storms plus tide state, You know, whether we're at the perigean or the king tide as it's commonly called now. Um, that's what's going to cause flooding. And then there's the coastal erosion problem, which, which is more, uh, you know, near term for people. The sea level is kind of the overhanging issue that's creeping up fractions of an inch a year, but like a drip filling the bucket. So the models that you refer to, the mapping, are really important, but they need to take into account more the short-term flooding on top of the slowly rising sea level and how the things happen in combination. Because it's, and the way that flooding happens is most of your, uh, you know, uh, users of, to US harbors certainly know even better than I, that when you think about flooding, whether it be in Bar Harbor, Maine or Portland or Boston or Martha's Vineyard or, uh, uh, and, and places that are even fairly far inland up, up to tidal rivers, up the Hudson, or up, uh, um, you know, the Connecticut River, up into Hartford, people don't even think about that. But uh, Hartford could, would flood by sea level rise, even though it's miles inland, just as Sacramento is, or Washington, D.C., don't appear to be on the ocean. So we've got to look at flooding and the mapping and uh, the visualization tools really carefully, but they've got to make sure that they not only take account of the increasing storms we're seeing, and the heavier rainfall, which causes heavier runoff downhill. There's lots of different causes of flooding. Sea level rise is raising the base level. And we tend not to see it because it only increases quarter of an inch a year, but accelerating. So the mapping uh, needs to help us see how different flood factors combine. And then in conjunction with the, the, bent, the uh, bathymetry, the um, what are, you know, like a nautical charts, the depth, the depth of the, the, the bays and the harbors and the estuaries where the water piles up during storm events. So that's why it's great to see the increasing sophistication of mapping tools because flooding comes from a multiple of sources. Sea level is just kind of the stealth factor, but it's the permanent change. So it's great to see the uh, great... Uh, and growing technology to improve that mapping and, and uh, modeling. Great, um, thank you so much. And um, I just did one, have actually one other question. When I read your book, I was startled to um, understand that um, Alaska does not have rising sea levels. And while uh, many of the rest of us do, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, thank you, Anastasia. I'm so glad you said that. Because, As I mentioned, I actually did a, a webinar this morning in Sweden, and they have the same thing, all high latitudes. So from Alaska to Canada to Scandinavia to Russia, okay? The, the, the areas that are in the really high north, um, where the ice sheet retreated most recently, okay? As, as the ice sheet retreated in a warming planet and went northward, so the ice disappeared from those places most recently. And because that weight of two miles of ice um, 
was removed within the last 10,000 years, which is like a blip in geologic time, the land is still moving upward, what we call uplift. In some places in the world, the land is moving downward, subsidence like New Orleans and Jakarta, uh, the land is going down. And relative sea level is, has to take into account what's happening to the land as well as the water level. I know that sounds confusing, but to make it real, uh, thanks to your question, in Northern Scandinavia and Alaska, the land is uplifting, let's say a half inch a year, not much, but every inch it's getting higher. Sea level's rising at a quarter of an inch a year. So relatively, it looks like sea level's falling. In the North of Sweden, they're saying, what's this thing with sea level rise? And yet, as the rate of sea level rise increases, as it will, as the ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica melt faster and faster, they're gonna get a real surprise because right now they're hearing about sea level rise, but they're not seeing it. In about 20 years, when the rate of sea level rise exceeds the land uplift, they're gonna suddenly say, oh, that's what sea level rise looks like. And that applies to Alaska, Canada, Scandinavia, and Russia. Thanks for clarifying that. And it, it's, a, it's a very interesting because many people say, well, how can my sea level rise be different than, uh, you know, the next state's over and uh, it really can be different. It can even be different hyperlocally, I assume. Oh yeah, and again, New Orleans would be the, the prominent US example, but Norfolk, Virginia has the same where the land is sinking and so sea levels rising faster as it's perceived. Jakarta, just as an example, uh, two years ago, they announced they're gonna move the capital of 15 million people or they're gonna move the capital which presently has 15 million people living in it because they have over 10 feet of sea level rise in the last 30 years because the land is sinking at that rate. And it's similar to New Orleans. New Orleans um, and, and Venice, Italy. I mean, there's a lot of places in the world because of pumping groundwater or petroleum or compacting silts, the land is going down. And that if the land goes down, sea level appears to go up. Uh, just it's further confusion, but I think that's simple enough that people can understand that. So, you're right, I get people saying, oh, how come in my, in my house, sea level is not higher? Well, first of all, it's hard to measure a quarter of an inch of sea level rise a year is the first thing that, how do you see that amidst waves and tides and, 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 and so on, right? And weather patterns, that's the first fallacy. You can't, I can't even see a quarter of an inch of sea level difference, but it's the cumulative effect. It's like the trip filling the bucket. And then the fact that land moves up or down, which masks or hides, um, you know, the effect of the actual sea level. Great. Um, thanks, John. I think we, we're coming. We got to stay right on schedule. But it's been yep. so wonderful having you speak. And we may get other questions and we will um, consolidate them on an email. Um, so if you guys didn't get your questions answered, do not worry about that. Um, we will definitely get them answered if you if you have put them in the Q&A. And also, I want to encourage you all to read John's books. They're immensely readable and eye-opening. And as mentioned earlier, to celebrate the conference, we're selling these signed editions on our store. And Alicia has put that in the chat uh, for 20% off discount. Thank you so much for doing this. I will have to break off in about a half hour, but I will watch the rest of this tonight. And uh, I will answer those questions for anybody that submits them. And I hope we do this again. You, you put together a great program. Thank you so much, Anastasia. Thank you, it's been such a pleasure. Um, and now next up, I'm thrilled to introduce Renee Collini to talk about the changing coastal landscape and how communities are addressing risk and planning for adaptation. Renee runs Place SLR, that's a partnership between the Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant Consortium, Florida Sea Grant, NOAA Sea Grant and Mississippi State University Extension. Her work supports and enhances coastal community and environmental resilience in the Northern Gulf of Mexico, an area that is particularly vulnerable in the United States. She is also um, currently serving as an author on the fifth National Climate Assessment Coastal Effects chapter. And we're super thrilled to have us here with us today. Uh, Renee will be attempting, or we will be attempting to facilitate this, to answer questions live um, in the context of her discussion so that if you have a specific question about what she is talking about, you can click that raise your hand button and we will try to include you in the dialogue. 
However, we're not perfect with this technology, so bear with us. If your question is more general or um, we can answer it at the end of her session, just write it into that Q&A window. We promise we'll get to it either at the end of her session or via follow-up. So Renee, thank you so much. We're uh, looking forward to seeing what you have to share. All right, I'm just double checking. You can see everything and hear me. Um, yep, looks good on, on my side. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm happy that for once, I'm not the one who had to list all of the affiliations that I have because it's extensive. Um, I do want to just take a quick second to talk about PLACE, the Program for Local Adaptation to Climate Effects. Um, we've been doing this work in one way or another since 2014 across specifically Mississippi, Alabama, and Northwest Florida to try and help turn sea level rise science and the research into the impacts into something actionable. And so sort of the lessons learned and the sort of accumulation of that is what I hope to share with you all today. And again, I'm just going to reiterate, put questions in the chat, um, you know, put them in the Q&A box. I, I should probably direct you there because that's what they've been asking for. Um, just because some of my content builds and I want to make sure that everyone's following along as we go. So the first thing I want to do is give you a sense of where we're headed today. I am going to talk briefly about changing shorelines and those impacts. And then I'm going to touch on really how to make decisions in this uncertain future. As we've already heard, we don't know exactly how much these are going to rise. We just know they're rising. And so how is a person supposed to move forward with such a large range in a meaningful way? And then I'm going to give you some case studies from on the ground, real world experiences of what people have been doing to try and tackle this issue. Now, I do work in the Gulf, so a lot of my examples are from the Gulf. But I have colleagues and teammates who work all across the US. So if there are relevant examples to your area, I will do my best to bring them in if you have a specific question. So the first thing I wanted to touch on is kind of moving past um, what we just heard about the water coming up and get into a little bit more about what that does to our shorelines. And even small changes, like we've heard when we mentioned, oh, it's a millimeter here, a few inches there, start to reshape our shorelines. That tide energy, that wave energy that's happening is suddenly happening in new places and in new ways, and it reshapes the shoreline. And when that happens, even those subtle changes can have big impacts on our flood risk. And it's not just our beachy shorelines, though I think that's what we automatically think of, but it's also some of our vegetated habitats, our rocky shorelines, they all face some kind of change with even a little bit of rise. And that needs to be considered as we're moving forward. And one of my favorite analogies for this uh, is if you think about like your nephews or nieces, you know, you don't see them every day. And so when you finally see them, you're like, oh my gosh, they grew so much. But when you see your kid every day, sometimes you don't realize how much change has been happening. A very similar sort of subtle phenomenon. So we know that changes are happening. We know that they're important. Um, and so how do we move forward, right? And so the first thing I want to specify is that there is not a set path for sea level rise resilience. There isn't a, a list, a checkbox you can go through. But there are these similar elements around all of them. You need information, you need an action plan, and then you need to implement it. And it doesn't, it sounds very linear, but <laughs> those all look very different as I'm gonna talk about. And there are also a lot of other similarities across different pathways. You need to make sure you're engaging people on the ground, your stakeholders, your residents. You need to get information and data gathering, and you're gonna keep revisiting this. The science is gonna keep getting better, more information is gonna become available. And so, Often though, as sea level rise resilience starts to move forward, everyone hits this stop sign, right? How much sea level rise should I plan for? I think I already saw it in the chat a couple times. Uh, but to know how much sea level rise you should plan for, you need to give some context to that question. And it's not really about your planning for higher water levels. It's more that you're planning for what sea level rise and higher water levels do. And so in some cases that means reduced storm drainage. And these are some older clips, but I had just as many this year and a lot of these gravity fed systems, rainfall just isn't going to be able to escape as fast because they're losing head space as seas come up. When you're planning for sea level rise, you're talking about how storm surge is worse, whether it's tropical, tropical storms in the east and, and Gulf Coast, or if it's the coastal storms on the west coast, understanding like this was a tropical storm. We're used to these in the Gulf. They do not usually throw this much water. So understanding that that's what we're talking about when we're saying how much sea level rise should I plan for? Plan for. There's also, like I mentioned, this increased erosion, right? The water is getting into new places and affecting those areas that had different energies. High tide flooding, I think we've already talked about that some and I'm gonna leave a lot of that for David. <laughs> just know that just the tide by itself is suddenly gonna become a problem more than it was before. 
And then saltwater intrusion, there's not a good picture for demonstrating salt water getting into drinking water or into our infrastructure other than just rusty things. And this, even for those of us who live on the coast and are accustomed to it, when it happens that much more often, now we're talking about changing maintenance schedules and things like that. And so what that turns out to mean for people, these changes are one health risks. You know, water standing where it shouldn't be impacting say septic tanks and things like that starts to impact the health of our communities. When we're planning for sea level rise. We're also talking about safety issues that just come with more frequent and more often flooding. We're also thinking about the direct damages we sustain, both as individuals and our personal investments, but also these investments we've made together as a community. And then there's economic disruptions. And there's the simple ones, the straightforward, you think about a business is closed and so somebody can't get to a specific business, therefore revenue are not being generated. But that also leads to reduction in services. So this is just an example. I'm not calling out a specific city or place, but just a general fair model of the fact that local revenues generate substantial amounts of services for things like schools, police, fire. And so when you start to impact local production of money, then you're impacting the services that are happening locally. And then of course, there's the direct impact of production services. You can't get your emergency services to people or you're cutting off things like roads. This is just a high tide in Alabama. This is not a lake, this is a road. <laughs> and this was a person, um, a local guy actually, who had come to stay on this particular town. He wanted to just go buy some lunch and buy a few knickknacks. And so not only did he not have access to this road, the service that was paid for, he also didn't go and spend money. So all these things kind of can build on each other. And then finally, there are cultural impacts. Our coasts are known for all kinds of things, good food, good views, shipbuilding, a myriad of things, not to mention the ports and all of the revenue that they generate. But there's only so much of this that we can take before that culture and those systems start to become impacted. So when we're talking about how much sea level rise should I plan for, what you're really asking is, what about these things should I be planning for and to what degree? The good news is by thinking about it in this context, we can start to change this outcome, right? We can preserve our services, our infrastructure, our health, our communities and our cultures, but it will look differently. We're gonna to have to move forward in a different way and reimagine kind of how the shoreline is gonna to look to be prepared for and absorb these changes. Another side of the coin to how much sea level rise should I plan for is understanding sea level rise. Now I'm gonna skip a few slides because John covered it pretty well. But there's a few more I just want to reiterate. So we already know what sea level is. That was well covered as long. In addition to how we know, and again, David's going to talk about this even more. So I'm going to keep rolling. We also talked about what's causing it. And so these are that, that eustatic sea level rise, what we've been hearing about with the melting land ice and the thermal expansion. But there's also this idea that as the ice is melting, it doesn't impact our shorelines the same. And so I'm just, this is kind of a complicated figure. So I'm going to walk you through it. Where you see the darker red, that means that that particular ice sheet melt is going to influence or cause more water to end up in that part of the world. And so some key takeaways here is there's a lot of differences in some of the US from some types of melt, <laughs> uh, but not in others. Like there's just a lot of red over here from the West Antarctic ice sheet. Um, but so that it's not only that it's rising in the whole globe, but it's rising differently as we've already begun to touch on. Additionally, like we mentioned, there's what's happening with the ground itself and under it. So sediment compaction, pulling out oil, natural gas, overpumping of groundwater can actually make the ground itself get lower, right, through subsidence. And so when that happens, as we mentioned, the water appears to be a lot higher, a lot faster. And then there's also this idea of the isostatic rebound, which is the complicated way of saying the ground is still recovering from the glaciers. And so when you have a glacier sitting on a, a shoreline or a coast or a continent, think about when you sit on the edge of a mattress, right? Where you are sitting goes down and then on either side of you, there's a bulge that comes up. The same thing happens to our entire continent. And so as these ice sheets have reversed themselves and melted back, then we have this phenomenon where some parts are bouncing back up from the ice sheets but those pieces that were on the edges, New Orleans, New York, those areas, they're actually going back down from the, that bulging up effect. So if you put this all together, you get what's called relative sea level rise. And it's this combination of that global or sometimes called eustatic sea level rise. Those, they're called climactic signals you know, for how the ice sheet melt impacts different areas in different ways. And then the fact that the land itself is out there moving around on its own. So together, putting all those pieces together, 
you can see how sea level rise will rise differently in different places. And so here is a snapshot, one of many of NOAA's tools that I use regularly to talk about this stuff. That's tracking not sea level rise in the future, but sea level rise that's already happened, or I should say sea level change that's already happened. And as mentioned, you can see over here, there's not as much of the upness, not as much rise in the Alaska area because the land is rebounding so quickly, it's rebounding faster than the sea level is rising. But then if you zoom in to say the Gulf or over here on the East Coast and really along the West Coast, the water is rising, but at different rates. So we're gonna zoom into the Gulf because that's my home and the place I care about a great deal. You can see, as we've talked about, the Delta of Louisiana has those big scary red arrows, but we have lots of yellow in this area too. And so just to give you a sense of not only the fact that water is rising differently in different places, but it's also not rising in a sort of linear or steady fashion. Again, something we've already heard about, but I just want to reiterate. So this is um, the Dauphin Island tide gauge, and I was hoping to do it a little more interactive, but I think it might just get too complicated. So in your head, think about since 1966, when this tide station went in, how much you think water has risen at that spot. I'm gonna give you just five seconds to think about how much you think sea levels have risen in Dauphin Island, Alabama since 1966. So almost nine inches since 1966, which is a lot when you consider how low and flat those coastlines are. Now, how much of that do you think has happened in the past 25 years? Again, I'll give you just five seconds to play the game with yourself, see if you're right. almost seven. So not only are seas rising at different rates in different, in different places, but it's accelerating. It's starting to rise faster. Fortunately, we now have projections of sea level rise at that more localized level, which is a huge improvement for those of us that are doing on the ground planning. And to give you a sense of how important this is, these are projections for uh, Jackson County, Mississippi. And if you look at those X's, on the far right side of the graph over here, that is where those curves with the corresponding colors would terminate if we were just looking at the global average. But as you can see here, if you're planning for sea level rise in Jackson County, Mississippi, you need to be thinking about a lot more sea level rise than the global average if you're gonna be planning effectively. Luckily, like I said, these data are available um, the, the most recent update was in 2017, and I'll touch on this again, but this, the scenarios are updating as we speak. You can get a printable PDF resource that prints out not only what your curves are for your county or for your city and gives you some key points of different time steps you might be interested in, but there's also some information on the back about what the likelihood of these scenarios are and how you might want to apply them. Again, something I'll talk about a bit more as we move forward. There's also an online web resource if you want to access this a little more quickly. Um, you can go to localslr.org and you can just click on the tide station or the grid station that you're interested in and get some more information about the projected rates of sea level rise there. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about this sort of offline. I, I built this particular tool. So if you have any questions, you can follow up in my email at the end. So thinking about all that again, how much sea level rise should I plan for? Now that we've got a good handle on when we're planning for sea level rise, what does that really mean? And when we're saying how much sea level rise should I plan for, an understanding of what sea level rise actually is. The problem is there isn't a good answer for this question. It's not even really the right question because there is a big range. We saw that for Jackson County, it went somewhere between two feet and 11 feet of sea level rise by 2100. That's not manageable if you're trying to plan for the future and make concrete decisions with anything from concrete to houses to restoration of coastal resources. So reframe the question, how should I deal with uncertainty in sea level rise for this instance? And so really underscoring here uncertainty, how do you deal with uncertainty and then for this specific instance? So the approach you use may not be the same every time. So step one to understanding which approach for uncertainty you should apply really depends on understanding why we don't have a set number for how much water is gonna rise. So I think there's this tendency for people to think there's such a large range because scientists just don't know what they're doing. Uh, and the reality is there's some good reasons. We've already heard about some. I'm gonna just distill into a few reasons that I think are most important to keep in mind. 
One is we don't know how much carbon is going to be in the atmosphere. And as we've heard already, there's this tight relationship between carbon emissions or CO2 in the atmosphere, that's what this line here is, and then of course, temperature. And so you see this wiggle here, the line there, that's temperature and CO2 moving together. The problem is scientists can't predict what people are gonna do, right? <laughs> so that's one reason why we don't have a set number because what people do will influence how much water rises. Another reason is coming back to this natural variability. So I'm gonna use the same graph because I already kind of explained it, but again, that blue is temperature and it's not just a straight line. We already know that lots of things in nature have wiggle, if you will. April does not look the same every year. April 2nd doesn't look the same every year. And there's lots of things that have a range in which they exist. And if you start to think about those ranges building on each other, some can counteract each other, some can expand each other or amplify each other. That range of how things could be or exist needs to be taken into account. So that's another reason why we do have a range. And then finally, we've had some talk about this already. The ice sheet melt is the science to watch. It is continuing to get better. It's still advancing. The updates to the IPCC and the upcoming updates to those, the US projections of sea level rise include some of that. And it's an ongoing discussion. But none of that means that um, we should take this range to mean that we don't know what we're doing. What it means is you can rethink about it as the range of what's scientifically possible to happen, right? This is the range of scenarios that could happen. But it also doesn't mean they're all equally as likely. So again, this is um, um, from that 2017 update of scenarios. And I'm just going to walk you through the table. Here you see each of those scenarios, low to extreme. And then you have different carbon emission projections, right? And just these are simple descriptions. I know they're not perfect. But if you look at the different ideas of how much carbon emissions occur, you can see here that the low scenario is really likely to happen no matter what we're looking at. <laughs> In particular, if you look at this one, it says 100%. If you think it's easy to get all the scientists to agree that something's 100% likely to happen, you have not met enough scientists. <laughs> um, that's, that should tell you, that should knock you down over that they said 100%. But again, as you move into these more extreme scenarios, you see that they're less likely to happen. They could still happen but it does not mean that there is likely to happen. Additionally, as you move across from this no change in carbon emissions to a fairly substantial reduction in carbon emissions, you'll notice while the low and is you know, not really what, changing much and the likelihood to be exceeded, we start to see some drop in some of these other scenarios. And this gets back to the idea that we can change how much the water is gonna rise if we get ahead on those emissions as well. But our takeaway for planning, implementing practical steps forward is just knowing that these scenarios are not all as equally likely to happen. And again, I want to reiterate, because sometimes it can be difficult to keep up, that the scenarios are about to come out, new ones, updated ones, um, either the end of this year or early next year. <laughs> uh, you know how these things go. Um, but it will also see some shifts in the actual numbers along with some of these probabilities. So before I move forward <laughs> into how on earth you use all this information to make decisions? Are there any questions about some of the basics that I either reiterated or that I introduced just now? And Anastasia, if you just wanna read out some questions that are relevant to this, let me know. I just wanna make sure we're moving forward um, with everybody on the team. Yeah, I think we're good right now um, as we're moving along. So, um, you know, there are some questions, but I think we can answer them um, at the end probably it seems you. Okay, sounds great. I'm gonna keep rolling then. So we understand a little bit about sea level rise and, and what's going on. Um, so now let's get into some of those approaches more specifically. I wanna caveat this by saying there are a lot of approaches for dealing with uncertainty, not just about sea level rise, but in general. I'm gonna talk about three. The first is using risk tolerance. The second is using scenario planning. And the third is using adaptation pathways. And I do know that adaptation pathways has lots of meanings in the climate change and sea level rise resilience world. So I'm going to get into the specifics um, when I get there. But these are the three I'm going to talk about today. And they do have some commonalities. The first is that with all of these, there is the ability to integrate stakeholders. And I cannot understate how important that is. So much so that's one of the breakout groups, right? And they all three permit you to make decisions in an uncertain future, moving forward with some ownership and transparency of where those decisions came from. The three also require 
clear goals and objectives, understanding what you're trying to accomplish and what it's, how to get there essentially. And you can use these in standalone or in combination. This is not meant to be you pick one method and that's what you always use. And I'm going to show you a couple examples of that as we go forward. But you know, these can be used together and in partnership with each other. The first is risk tolerance. I think this is the most well-known in the sea level rise resilience world. Um, but this leverages those exceedance probabilities. So that's what these were, right? The probability that we'll see a scenario exceeded. And it considers the project's specific risk tolerance and the timeline for the actual project. Risk tolerance is well suited for stable projects and in and stable locations. So like if you have fixed critical infrastructure, if you're thinking about conservation purchases, um, really built and non-living structures, and then things that are either really, really important or really, really unimportant. <laughs> you don't want to use this approach if you're talking about a dynamic system. This is not really well suited for that. And then there's some aspects of restoration and conservation that may not be um, well suited for this either. Thinking about, you know, marsh platform design, for example, that would not be a time you'd want to use this. So how does it work? If you have a high tolerance for risk, that means that if you get hit by a flood or some kind of impact from sea level rise, it's not going to be a big deal. If you have a low tolerance for risk, that means it's going to be a very big deal, will have a major impact. Now, risk tolerance is inherently subjective, but there are some questions you can ask yourself and your stakeholders to try and build an objective sense of where you should be on this spectrum. One is scale dependent. How big is this thing going to be right off the bat? The bigger it is, the lower your tolerance, more likely. Location dependent. And this is not just about proximity to water, but also about the culture of the location. How people in the bayous of Louisiana feel about living with water is going to be real different than, say, somebody in a suburb of the city of Mobile. So that's also something else to keep in mind. There's cost and value. These are separate because they're not the same thing. Something can be inexpensive but have a lot of value to a community, to a community culturally. So it's important to think about both of those aspects. Again, more value, more cost, lower risk tolerance. Function is a big one. How critical is the service being provided? How many people are impacted? You know, this, these are questions you want to ask yourself. If it's a whole county, that's a lot of people. And if it's a critical service for the whole county, that is an even bigger deal. So again, lower risk tolerance. Length of time. If you want this thing to last a while, you do not need it being impacted by flood. <laughs> so you need to be thinking about the longer you want it to last, probably the likely your risk tolerance is, is low. And then finally, adaptability. Is this a structure you can easily change, move, somehow adapt to rising seas or floods? If it's adaptable, then maybe your tolerance is a little bit higher. So then you take your risk tolerance and you go back to these likelihoods. And I just pulled the ones assuming no change in carbon emissions, which is pessimistic and I hope not real, but that's what we're gonna just work with for now for simplicity's sake. If you have a low tolerance for risk, you're going to be looking at these scenarios that are less likely to happen, right? They have a low chance of happening, but they could happen. And you want to make really sure that whatever it is that has a low tolerance for risk is not going to be impacted by this. So Renee? Oh, yeah? Can you just give one example of what might be something that would have that scenario? Yeah, I have some of those come up, but I can definitely. So for example, um, critical facilities are a big one in terms of say, we heard nuclear power plant, but those don't go in very often. Also like wastewater treatment facilities, particularly in rural areas where they cover a large proportion of the population. In my opinion, hospitals would be another one that would be an example of that. Thanks. Um, yeah, no worries. And then for a moderate tolerance for risk, um, this is where you're going to fall sort of in that intermediate range, you know, again, moderate chance, you're avoiding the like only what's likely is most likely to happen, but you're not planning for the worst case scenario. And for frame of reference, uh, I bought a house a couple of years ago and I went with intermediate. <laughs> I was like, okay, where does storm surge go in an intermediate scenario? I would like to be outside of that, please. Because again, I like to live near the coast, so I didn't want to be really far away. But at the same point, I also work on flood resilience and really wasn't interested in getting flooded. And then if you have a high tolerance for risk, you're really only going to plan for things you're really sure are going to happen. So if you're building a shed or a boardwalk or something that has low impact, just plan for what you know is likely to happen in the time frame you hope it will exist. So here's an example. Again, I have put hospital in a coastal county, and I consider that to be a low risk tolerance situation. That may be different depending on if it's your sixth 
hospital in a major city, maybe it's not. So again, it's kind of location dependent. Um, but for me, in a place with not a lot of access to healthcare in general, a hospital is very critical. So if we're starting in 2020, and I want my hospital to last for say around 50 years, then we're gonna move forward to 2070. And again, low tolerance for risk. So you're thinking about that high sea level rise scenario. So now when you're planning for this hospital, you're thinking about four feet of sea level rise over the next 50 years, which is a much more manageable number than the range that we started out with. And so it's really important to be thinking about all the things that are important to you in addition to flooding, but how important is it, how, you know, how, how critical is it that it not be flooded and make sure that you're designing to those standards. The important thing about this number, four feet, is it's still relatively meaningless. It's great that you're planning for four feet, but what you're really planning for, remember how we started, is how those hazards change. What does high tide look like with four feet of sea level rise? What does storm surge look like with four feet of sea level rise? How does stormwater drainage change with four feet of sea level rise? So for example, if I'm building this coastal hospital in you know, coastal Mississippi, if this is my high tide today, I'm gonna look at say four feet of sea level rise with what high tide looks like with four feet of sea level rise. And so you can see here that the kind of information you can get, and this is another NOAA tool I use all the time, is information on where low lying areas might be, Again, where that high tide flooding might be. And then you can start to think about infrastructure, right? Where your stormwater outfalls are impacted. So you wanna make sure that your hospital area isn't drained by an outfall that's covered up with high tide. Or you, know, you wanna make sure lift stations that service nearby are not gonna be inundated with water. You can also think about transportation routes. If you're a hospital, EMA routes and commerce routes are really important for you. Same thing with maintenance and general things like that. One thing I wanted to point out, and we go back to this model image really quickly, is that we talked in the beginning about how the shoreline will change over time. Some coastal models will be able to show you that change and then how the water will move, right? In this case, with the NOAA model, it's for the entire United States, it assumes the static shoreline. It's called the bathtub model. And there are pros and cons to both. This one's um, not computationally expensive. And so it gives you great information, but it is sort of a screening level tool. So keep in mind that there may be some subtle differences between what's seen and what happens here. Another thing you might want to consider are your changes in future storm surge for this hospital, particularly because um, for me, you know, storm surge is important. If you look at, this is what storm surge looks like now in the Northern Gulf along coastal Mississippi. And then you can look and see what it looks like with around four feet of sea level rise. And so you can see going back and forth, the footprint changes and really importantly, areas that already have substantial flood, it gets much deeper. And so this provides information where you can look at those changes in the 1% and 0.2% annual chance flood depth, you can see what, what kind of freeboard you might want to build in, which is height above what the projected floods are now, and think about infrastructure that could be at risk. And if you need your hospital operating in a hurricane, then you need to make sure that people can get to it, or that if you need to get people out ahead of a hurricane, you can. And then we talked again about the static models, the bathtub models. In this particular case, and this tool is not available everywhere in the US, but there are models like it available in many places. They actually went in and modeled how the shoreline was gonna change as seas rise. They considered some erosion, they considered how barrier islands would adapt, they considered how the marshes themselves would change, and then put all that together and then modeled storm surge on top of that. And so this is what's called the dynamic model. And I only say this to say that it's good to know which kind you're working with because you get a little bit more detail and a little bit closer to that uh, ability to make concrete decisions with it. So I'm gonna give you some examples of how this has happened in the real world. The Jackson County Utility Authority has been really focused in Mississippi on sea level rise resilience. And so one thing they're thinking about is they are consolidating three of their facilities into one. And so their wastewater treatment facilities. And so in doing so, we're talking about making this a really critical piece of infrastructure. It's gonna service most of the county. They looked at sea level rise at two different phases. The, they looked at six feet of sea level rise because they were they had a low tolerance for risk. And the first time they looked at it was for selection of high tide because they wanted to make sure when they were buying land, <laughs> it was not going to be a piece of land that was inundated by sea level rise or by high tide, even with six feet of sea level rise. And so they looked at all the other things that are important when you're buying a piece of property to put in a wastewater treatment facility, proximity to service area, the ability to actually buy the property, 
uh, all kinds of considerations about the population and people living around the wastewater treatment facility. Of course, nobody wants it in their own backyard. So lots of things to consider around availability. They narrowed it down to three sites and then they picked the one, the only one that was not gonna be impacted by high tide, even with six feet of sea level rise. The next thing they wanted to do was build a flood protection berm around the wastewater treatment facility because their previous experiences have shown without it, if a hurricane comes, they're gonna get hammered and it's gonna be really hard to provide this critical service. And so they wanted to plan for a 0.2% annual chance event, sometimes called the 500 year storm. And they wanted to look at 50 years worth of sea level rise. So we were planning for a brown six feet of sea level rise in that time frame. if you're using the low tolerance scenarios. And what we found is that equals out to about four feet of increase in sea level rise in uh, storm surge. So I'm gonna say that one more time. When planning for six feet of sea level rise, when they looked at storm surge at their particular location, the surge only increased by about four feet. So that was the berm that they looked at building. We even did a cost benefit analysis to make sure that accounting for sea level rise on such a low probability event storm would even be worth spending money on. And it turns out that it was. <laughs> and for those of you who are architects and engineers and really into the details on planning, we did this just at the, after the 15% design was done, um, just to make sure that we had that information early on. But they also used the risk tolerance approach in a completely different way. They wanted to understand and prioritize the septic tanks that were at risk to sea level rise in their area. So we went around and did that for them, identified where those tanks were and what their level of risk was moving forward in the future. And so in this particular case, because this is not as critical and they're looking at much shorter term, only 30 years, they only decided to look at one and two feet of sea level rise. Also because this has to be prioritized. They cannot tackle all of this at one time. So they really needed to focus on the immediate changes that were coming in that near term. And so this is, this is how they decided how much sea level rise to plan for in this particular case. Any questions about risk tolerance before I get into some of the other um, types of approaches? I know I'm going kind of quick. <laughs> I think you're good to go um, right now. And um, I'm not seeing anything right this way, but there are a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. So thinking about scenario planning, this is a different approach altogether. And this was actually directly from the military. This does more of exploring plausible, not probable futures. And it considers the outcome of specific management action. So instead of in the previous one, where we figured out how much sea level rise we wanna plan for based on risk tolerance, and then looked at how conditions would change and then designed accordingly. Here, you're not only looking at how things change, but also how your actions may respond to that. And so what you're really looking for here are actions that work under a variety of futures. This is really well suited for complex situations that have a lot of different interactions. Um, this is more common in natural resource management, though my colleagues tell me it's happening quite a bit in built environment and other places. And this is really well suited for things like a mid-level to high importance. It is not well suited for simple situations with a lot of effort for something that's straightforward. Um, this is really great for critical infrastructure or low to risk tolerance projects. And I say that because if it's got low risk tolerance, why spend the time looking at how it responds in some of those not as bad cases when you know it has to work for the worst case. And then finally, um, it's also not, it's a lot of effort if it's a high risk tolerance project. If you're not that worried about flooding or it's not that impactful, again, scenario planning may not be for you. So I'm gonna walk you through an example. Um, this is a simplified distilled version of, of something that's happened in real life. I'm not gonna get into the details because I've oversimplified it quite a lot to make it fit in this presentation. But in our example, we're trying to preserve services and benefits provided by marshes in a rapidly developing area that's also at risk to sea level rise. So the first thing you have to do are identify your drivers of change and impact, sea level rise and land use. Then you need to develop scenarios. This is where things start to get complicated. So if your two drivers are sea level rise and land use, let's just say you could have high sea level rise or low sea level rise, and you could have a lot of development or not so much development. So that gives you four different scenarios that you could be facing in the future. And so you can imagine how this could actually get really complicated really quickly. Then you need to model the scenarios, understanding what those different futures might look like. So in our example, you don't feel like you have to read all this, but if there was a lot of sea level rise, but not a lot of development, 
there wouldn't be a lot of capacity for the marshes to migrate inland, but there'd be land there and there wouldn't be a lot of vertical accretion. But then if you look at not a lot of sea level rise, but a lot of land development, it's almost the inverse. There's a lot of capacity for the marshes to move inland, but there's not a lot of places for them to go and they could grow vertically in place. So these are all the things you might wanna consider about your scenario and what it would look like. So then you have to consider how you wanna to respond to that. Um, these are just a snapshot of some of the ones this particular group came up with, but they wanna conserve lands that are risky for development. They're considering beneficial use of thin layer placement, putting in living shorelines and breakwaters, and then full on restoration as their choices. So finally, we get to the meat of scenario planning, which is, again, you want to see how these management actions fare under the different potential scenarios they could occur in. I just went with the stoplight coloring here, again, just to make it clear. Um, but you can see your action is here, conserving land or doing beneficial use, and how it fares under different futures. So conserving lands doesn't work out great if there's not a lot of land use, uh, but there's a lot of sea level rise because it doesn't really get at the heart of the problem. You can also look at combination of choices. So if you're conserving and restoring or looking at say conserving and beneficial use, and you can see here in this particular case, you'd go with this strategy because while it's not the best in every scenario, it does have the best outcomes across all of them, right? A moderate to high outcome in every single one. Whereas in these other ones, you have some red, meaning if there is one of those features that shows up, that particular choice of action wouldn't work out well. Any questions about scenario planning? Okay. Um, last one, adaptation pathways. I wanna be clear, this is about adapting to the impacts of sea level rise, not about carbon, carbon emissions, carbon futures, or climate mitigation. This is about impacts that are happening. So this is looking at a series of adaptation strategies and then building a pathway of when to implement them based on tipping points of sea level rise. This allows for you to take action based on observed changes in sea level, and you want to make sure that these actions build on each other and that you're not just suddenly switching paths altogether of what your adaptation strategy might be. This is really well suited for very dynamic systems, thinking dunes and beaches on barrier islands, you know, for example, it may not make sense to plan right away for six feet of sea level rise because the system could change so significantly with one major hurricane. This is also a good approach for low budget situations. Smaller communities may not be able to generate the capital right away to do everything, but they can start building and working towards a productive solution and identifying when they need to um, go after more money. This is not great for situations where you don't have a lot of adaptive capacity or when there are so many multiple drivers of change that are relevant to the question that you should probably be doing something more complex like the scenario planning or the risk tolerance approach. So our example is about a barrier island that's trying to prevent breaching. Again, I took a real world example and took out names and, and made it a little simpler. This is first step, identify suitable actions. So these are the ones they came up with, nourishing the beach, making it even wider to a historic footprint, raising dunes, elevating the driveways that cut through the dunes, and then burying a rock wall under the dune, all with the goal of trying to make sure that when smaller like category one tropical storms come through, the barrier island doesn't breach. So then you wanna do modeling to understand when each of these scenarios works and then look at how it works under different amounts of sea level rise. So again, unlike risk tolerance where you pick a scenario and then look at changing conditions, here you're taking a management action or an adaptation action and identifying how it works under those conditions at the start. And so here you've got to identify when those tipping, tipping points are. Nourishing the beach keeps it from breaching at the current footprint with only half a foot of sea level rise, but nourishing it to that wider historic footprint works for up to two feet of sea level rise and so on. And then you arrange them in a pathway. This was adapted from Smalligan et al. And you can see here, again, this is just theoretical, but you arrange them from the most costly or time intensive, from the least costly or, costly or time intensive to the most. And you can see too that it's not time, but you're tracking rise, observed rise in sea level to help you trigger when you should take action and accelerate to the next more expensive action. So I'm just gonna keep rolling because I know I'm short on time to show a couple quick case studies. The first is Dauphin Island. And just to show you how some of these things all come together, if you're looking at 
their efforts in 2005, they started working on a strategic plan that was adapted, adopted in 2010. And then they developed a comprehensive plan. And then from there, they started continuing to collect additional data and information to make sure they were staying true to the path and filling in gaps they had identified in the strategic plan. But then they also started to implement different plans. For example, they updated their zoning ordinances to protect their natural protections. They also started working on structural stability projects, adapting some of the entry points onto the island so they'd be more robust to rising seas and storms. And then they're also diversifying their economy away from the more vulnerable portions of the island so they have some resources that will sustain longer as seas rise. An important thing to point out when you think about this is that they do, this kind of planning doesn't just happen. And so Dauphin Island had some additional factors, including advanced capacity from my group and others with Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant, and they have a research facility right there on their island. There's also really dedicated community officials. And this is important over and over again, you'll see there's a champion moving these efforts forward. And they had lots of funding opportunities. All those efforts took money, whether it was a $40,000 planning grant or much larger money coming from Restore to do implementation. Ocean Springs, Mississippi took a different track. They did a straight sea level rise vulnerability analysis, updated their unified development code based on that. They also began to implement green infrastructure and they began working with their private sector so that they would start to do con continuity planning and be ready for changing conditions as well to make sure that they had that sort of small business protections and preparedness in place. Again, they also had additional capacity in the form of a climate and resilience community of practice of other professionals. They had that dedicated champion again, and also multiple small grant opportunities. And finally, I wanna talk about Apalachicola, Florida. Um, they did a sea level rise vulnerability assessment as well. They have a lot of historic architecture that's at risk. So they began informing people how to build new builds that match the historic architecture, but also was resilient to sea level rise and invested in understanding explicitly how to adapt existing historic structures. So they maintained their look and feel and character, but were much safer because this was their economic driver, is their economic driver. And just recently they got money to implement it. So that was very exciting. And again, they have extra capacity that I'm not gonna, Go into it's kind of the same thing, but remember there's no right answer to which approach to use for making decisions for an uncertain future. You need to consider the complexity of the question, the importance of the project and how adaptable it is. This is not even close to everything needed to plan for sea level rise, but it's a good start. Um, and remember that robust and inclusive stakeholder engagement is really needed for any approach in order for it to work well. And that sea level rise resilience is an ongoing process that's needed to gather information, plan, implement, review, revisit, particularly because the science will continue to update. I'm just gonna skip my summary because I think I'm out of time and I wanna answer questions. <laughs> so, um, all right. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Renee. And I'm gonna just expand you up so you're a little bit bigger. I hope people are seeing that. Um, so we have a couple of questions um, that have come in. Um, the uh, one of them from Herman is Conservation Commission is constraining approaches to sea level rise more than risk tolerance. Is this a major confounding factor and is this a common problem? The Conservation Commission is constraining approaches to sea level rise risk more than risk tolerance. I don't I don't know that I understand that question. I'm so sorry. It's OK. We'll see if we can get Herman to give us um, to clarify his question, then we'll um, will uh, expand it. Um, so there's another question um, that's kind of more general, actually. This one came in particularly for Dauphin Island. What kind of changes to zoning ordinances um, were made and what kind of resistance was encountered? And there's actually a lot of questions we've had sort of offline about um, state and federal zoning regulations um, and, and local zoning regulations. So I was wondering if you could talk about what uh, you've sort of seen. Absolutely. So in terms of Dauphin Island specifically, um, a key thing they've been working on, like I said, is zoning that will protect their dunes and their wetlands because there's not a lot of place for the water to go. So you need wetlands to stay in place and absorb it. And they found that the Corps and other permitting agencies were using um, federal data sets, which are coarse compared to the size of, say, Dauphin Island. And so lots of wetland areas were being permitted as though they weren't wetland. And so they've gone and paid for a detailed study and are now implementing a much more um, robust set of restrictions on building 
that would infill or, or impact wetlands. And then the others for their dunes, they've increased the setbacks and how much you can build on them and go over them. And just recently they have been working to, um, that was actually one of the adaptation pathway strategies was theirs was elevating driveways to begin to require that, that you cannot lower the elevation of a dune in order to get access to your house if your house is on the seaward side of a dune. So those are a couple examples. Um, more broadly, there is definitely a challenge. So Ocean Springs kind of ran into this. They had that more um, sustainable building code as part of their update to their unified development code, but the developers know the state codes are not that strict. And so they will, you know, push and fight and convince and, you know, challenge until they get to build the way the state says they can build instead of the way the city wants them to build. So there's definitely some work that needs to be done to better coordinate the, the issues that communities are pursuing locally with what's happening at the state level. I will say a good example are things we're seeing in Florida, actually. So they put their money where their mouth is just recently when it comes to building resiliently. In 2015, they required all comprehensive plans to include sea level rise, though they did not specify how or how much. More recently, there has been money available to do vulnerability assessments in a more comprehensive way. And now they're beginning to, it's not regulatory yet, but it's slowly shifting that way where in order to get state money, you have to do assessments and state money meaning roads, building really anything with state funds. You have to do an assessment of how sea level rise will impact that build and they provide alternatives to consider. And while again, it's not regulatory, I think there's a big yet that's unsaid at the end of that sentence. And we're already seeing the state in Florida use the vulnerability assessments that have been happening and the science that's out there about projections of sea level rise to come up with a state vulnerability plan. And so instead of it being completely top down, they are considering the work that's already happening on the ground and the kind of building up. Great. And the, is there any, are there any solutions, um, sensible changes and reasonable plans that state and federal regulations or even local regulations have put in place, place for private homeowners that are trying to protect their uh, property? The one exciting thing, and I cannot remember if this is implemented yet or it's just on the docket with the, with all the legislation that's been happening lately, it's kind of a, a head spin, but it used to be you could only get money for things like elevating your home. Um, or relocation if you were a strategic, like a repetitive loss structure. And we're seeing changes in that. We're seeing more proactively, there's, it's, they're upping how much money you can get to elevate your home and you don't have to be a repetitive loss structure anymore. So hopefully we're gonna start to see people proactively minimizing damages. And then same thing with buyout programs. It's been really well acknowledged that buyout programs tend to focus on poor minority and underserved communities while protection infrastructure goes to wealthier, often white communities. And because that has now been acknowledged, there's been a, a, an effort to strategically rethink as a system how some of those relocation efforts can be better done. Great. Um, we have a, a question from Russ also. Um, is shoreline protection often a, a losing proposition? Breakwaters and other man-made solutions often fail or have other negative repercussions, for example, saving one beach at the risk of another, um, the ocean usually winning in the long run. And I will say that um, we did a podcast with uh, Derek Brockneck when he was running the American Beach and Shore Preservation Association. And um, he uh, was talking about this co concept of beach nourishment, um, which why I hadn't been aware of what that actually really means, which it means literally dumping sand, either dredged sand from the waterways or sand, uh, sand from other places. So and this is a really important um, question um, about these man-made and uh, breakwater structures. Yeah, and I think it comes back to that time component. You know, the sky isn't falling down tomorrow. The water isn't gonna be over our head tomorrow. And we have services and communities in place. And oftentimes communities that are in the place in the risky areas they are because of things like redlining or because they were a fishing village that needed proximity to water. Um, so it, I think there needs to be this balance of ensuring that ways in which we are damaging the shoreline sort of directly, boating, um, hardening our shorelines, things like that that cause the sediment to be lost from the system, doing what we can that makes sense fiscally to buy us some time, I think is a good idea. But the reality is, right, the water is coming up. We need to be honest with ourselves about how much and, and the timing of it and continuing to get better at that. Because 
we have learned from the few communities that have tried whole community movements. And I'm really curious to hear more about Jakarta actually, um, but here in the US it's been tried a couple times and it's been, we, everyone says just move. We are not good at that. <laughs> we are not good at that. We have even less information about that than, and how to do that well than we do about how much seas are gonna rise. And so this is a very complex socioeconomic challenge and we need some of that time that these shoreline protection measures, renourishing, living shorelines, putting sediment back that we've taken out can get us so we can get better at that. And again, so we can be strategic in planning when we think about you know, major, major disasters have always reshaped our shorelines. So let's have some laws and some plans in place so that we take advantage of that in a way that's productively reducing risk. Um, yeah, so one of our other questions, and actually just a super important question, and we would love all of our presenters to uh, weigh in on this potentially after the conference so that we can get this information out, but this question of how local governments initiate managed retreat planning is huge. As you mentioned, it's like tied in super socioeconomically and also what if a whole town is, is going to be threatened? That means a whole town has to relocate. How do you do that? And the his history, the identity, all of that. So um, please send us any resources or any examples that we can share with this community for that. Um, so another question here, um, property insurance costs can have a dramatic impact on future building plans. The reinsurance industry is often active in the background affecting the retail insurance that is available. Do you have an, any comments on the insurance involvement with all of this? <laughs> Just to reiterate something another panelist said about risk rating 2.0, um, the federal government's flood insurance program is becoming more like a private um, insurer, which means the influence of those reinsurers is growing as well. Um, and, and to say that this does get back to some of those questions around just and equity, but one way or another, we're going to have to start paying for the realities of our risk. And now that we've gotten better modeling and we know that seas are rising, so clearly have that data about where we're headed, that risk will continue to be considered in that cost of being insured for that risk. So that will be influencing, and that's a big part of this question of strategic retreat, retreat and relocation. Um, I'll just reiterate, because I work in a very rural and very poor region of the country that um, there are a lot of people who are in these places and have a sense of place. And so a gigantic jump in insurance is gonna be a real problem. So if you see legislation or, or information about ways for people to mitigate some of those costs that are below the poverty line or our subsistence living, um, I think that needs to be part of the conversation as well. Because again, it's not fair to just pull the rug out from under people who um, have been living in these places for a long time. Yeah, so <laughs> the majority of our other questions are li literally about funding. So uh, this is such a big, big question for all of us. And I know that, um, you know, even here locally, I've heard from select board people saying, you know, how do taxes relate to this? How does the state relate to this? How does the federal government relate to this? So I have two quick points on that. One, this infrastructure bill is a huge opportunity, um, along with several other um, legislative actions that have happened, but two, increasingly, if you don't have a plan that already looks at these challenges, it's going to be harder and harder to get the implementation money. So start planning now. And then something else to keep in mind too, is that there are models that move away from grants and influx from feds. They use that as a starting point to set up and establish funding mechanisms within the county or the city to pay for some of the adaptation or the relocation or whatever that might be that works for your specific town or county. Um, there's one example in, I think it's North Carolina and another example in um, Virginia. And I'll find those and include them when I send it over to you. Um, that would be super, super, super helpful. And um, we would love that because um, we are we are going to be um, providing links to all the information that the presenters have shared with us today and including some resources that you can use, you and your communities can use for planning. Um, and uh, we'll hope that um, people can start acting on these as soon as possible. So um, thank you so much, Renee. Uh, we love your work. Um, we're so proud of everything you're doing and um, we, we definitely wanna keep fully in touch with you. Um, so practical, which is really, really helpful for us too. So thank you. Um, if you have any additional questions for Renee, which we didn't get to, please put them in the Q&A window so we can capture them and get answers with you. And now, um, keeping up with our very packed agenda, 
We're going to have our first breakout session. That means uh, it's a short session of 15 minutes with two presenters. This one is on community engagement. Please note that due to the short time we have for these presenters, any questions that come up related to this session are gonna be answered in the follow-up email. And first up is Gail Bonus, and Gail manages the Municipal Climate Action Program at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Um, it's an incredible organization here uh, located in Portland, Maine, addressing the whole Gulf of Maine and doing vitally important work. So I really encourage you to check them out. Gail is passionate about melding science and education, and through her work at GMRI, she helps coastal communities better understand the impacts of their local sea level rise by giving them the skills and tools needed to develop community-focused and data-driven plans to adjust, adjust, uh, address coastal flooding and climate resilience. Really what Renee was talking about on the ground, feet on the ground. And so we're looking forward to hearing about your programs and welcome Gail. Oh, thanks so much, Anastasia. All right, bear with me while I pull up my share screen here. And All right, you should all be able to see that well. Um, thanks so much for having me and thanks for the great introduction and Renee for that transition into thinking about community engagement and stakeholder engagement um, as that's kind of the heart of the work that I've been doing here in Maine. Um, all right, so I'll just start off with a little bit about uh, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Um, we're a roughly 80 person nonprofit right here in the Portland waterfront in Maine, and we develop collaborative solutions to global ocean challenges, and we do this through three focus areas. One being research, and we have a team of scientists researching the Gulf of Maine ecosystems, how they're changing and what that means for communities, and particularly really focused on fisheries science and management. Our education team sees about 10,000 middle school students from across the state each year. Um, they come to our lab for hands-on learning, revealing what's in the Gulf of Maine and how it's going to be changing and also why that matters to them. And our community team is really focused on direct engagement with the entire seafood supply chain from vessel level fishermen to aquaculturists to dealers, processors, chefs and retailers working with them to build technical capacity, address emerging challenges, create new market opportunities, and promote sustainable harvest. And one thing that we've realized through all of our work across the organization is that many of our projects are very much rooted in and are impacted by climate change. So we really committed to in the last few years um, uh, branching out on that, and we launched a climate center last year. Um, so at the heart of that climate center is our municipal climate action program. Um, so for several years now, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute has had a deep level of engagement with uh, coastal communities, really specifically focused on sea level rise. And each of the projects within this program have been in response to community need or stakeholder needs that have been expressed. So I'm just going to run through some of these briefly. Our community programming is where this work really started. Uh, we partnered with the cities of Portland and South Portland to develop a program that facilitates public dialogue and engages folks in understanding sea level rise impacts. We accomplished this through narrative, a lot of storytelling, a lot of question and answer, interactive um, sea level rise maps, small group work with those, as, and a lot of dialogue with community members. We have a high school curriculum that we develop by collaborating with teachers, and this gives students the knowledge and data skills, as well as the confidence they need to engage their own communities in understanding the local impacts of sea level rise. It also provides teachers with a tool to connect their students to uh, real and relevant data that's meaningful for their communities, and also connects through to climate change standards in the curriculum. Uh, this curriculum can also inspire hope, um, hope in actions that are currently being taken to address climate impacts, as well as hope within students for the actions that they may take themselves. We collaborated with the city of South Portland to develop an interactive map to emerge the complex impacts of sea level rise to their community, particularly focused on the impacts to ecosystem, economy, infrastructure, and social well-being. Um, this map also aligns with the city's climate action and adaptation plan, so it's a really great communication tool for them um, in supporting the, the actions that they have laid out in that plan. Our newest project um, addresses 
capacity building. Um, similar to Renee, uh, Maine, and talking about rural communities, Maine is a really rural state. Um, we have a very uh, low capacity when it comes to planning, in particular climate planning. Um, so to address these under the under-resourced um, municipalities and the challenges that they face, um, this project is going to provide trainings to build the capacity um, by engaging current as well as emerging leaders in, 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 within these communities in building their knowledge, skill, and importantly, their relationships with each other as well as between communities within their region um, needed to develop community-driven climate plans. And I think most relevant to today's meeting is our citizen science work. Um, we were first approached by the city of Belfast, Maine, as they expressed a need to engage citizens in climate change impacts, as well as the need for local flood data. And citizen science is a really great, great platform to address both of these needs, especially in a state with um, over 4,000 miles of tidal coastline and only three uh, NOAA tide gauges. We know um, there's a lot of need for that local flood data, so we knew that Belfast wouldn't be alone in this. Um, last year, we launched the Coastal Flooding Storms and Sea Level Rise Citizen Science Project with, Bel with Belfast and have since expanded to include Portland, South Portland, as well as the island town of Vinyl Haven, and there are several other communities that will be joining this project really soon, and we welcome others. Um, this project uh, looks to answer the question, what water level and weather conditions lead to local flooding? So to accomplish this, we partner specifically with municipalities to identify coastal flood monitoring sites um, where they're interested in collecting this data and to really hone in citizen observations. Um, we also su have supported communities with linking through to or um, acquiring weather stations and that weather data and we're excited about the possibility of partnering with U.S. Harbors on collecting that local water level data. We support communities through engagement events such as this one. Um, so last week, 50 folks joined us at GMRI um, during a predicted high, high tide events, so one of those extreme tides or king tides. We took a stroll down Commercial Street um, right along the waterfront here in Maine, um, in Portland, and we stopped at several of those coastal flood monitoring sites along the way. Uh, folks took photographic evidence of that flooding that they observed on this day. Um, as you can see, uh, we did get to experience firsthand what that sunny day flooding looks like. This was an 11 and a half foot tide. Um, in Maine, our highest annual tide is 12 feet. Um, and just for reference uh, to what we're, think, what we're planning and preparing for regarding sea level in Maine, um, we passed a law in this past June for, um, for what to expect. So for the year 2050, we are planning for 1.5 additional feet of sea level on top of that 12. Um, but we need to be prepared for up to four feet. For the year 2100, we're planning for four feet, but need to be prepared for up to 8.8 .8 feet. So that's following the intermediate and those high curves that you saw on the sea level data earlier on. And then for reference, this was an 11 and a half foot tide. So not quite up to that 12 foot level. And we're already experiencing some flooding. So after data is collected, um, folks can upload their photographs to the um, Coastal Flood Monitoring Site webpage, um, along with the location and time data. And they also answer questions about what they observed. Um, what kind of impact was what their observation was having to them, um, as well as to their communities, and we want them to rate their level of concern. So that way, this qualitative and quantitative data can be used by municipalities to support them in making decisions and prioritizing plans for adaptation actions. Um, so just like every community is really unique um, as far as what, what impacts they're facing, what solutions they'll need, they're also unique in their community engagement plans. So we've designed these projects um, to be really flexible to meet their unique needs. Thanks. Thank you so much, Gail. Um, that was really awesome. I know it's a very, very short amount of time to be able to present, but um, we love the work that you're doing and certainly um, encourage it as a model uh, for everyone else that um, might be interested in uh, doing this kind of thing. Um, so uh, moving right on, um, keeping on track, hopefully, our second presenter this session is um, Joseph, Joseph Sukawi. 
Joseph is with New York City's Waterfront Alliance and leads their WEDGE, that's uh, an acronym for Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines Program. That's like a leads program for building on the waterfront. So it's gonna, he's gonna extend more into, and hope, hopefully he'll talk a little bit about zoning too. Um, he brings years of experience in port and waterfront operations, economic development policy and infrastructure, including working at, as New York City's council member on transportation and supporting the American Red Cross and disaster response or operations. He brings all of this to his work, supporting climate planning and resilience in the New York and New Jersey area. Welcome, Joseph. We're glad you can join us. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for putting on such a, a wonderful event today. Uh, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, indeed. Great. So uh, thanks for that introduction. I'm going to move very quickly because this is a, a, such a short presentation. Uh, and I want to help keep the event on time. So I'm going to talk about the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, the WEDGE program, um, which as, as she just shared, is kind of like lead but for the waterfront. So this is a national standard for how you do waterfront design well. And, and WEDGE focuses on resilience, ecology, and access at the waterfront. So to give you kind of a snapshot of where WEDGE is today, we have um, 10 wedge verified projects across the country. Um, there are about six more in the pipeline. The, the system's only been around for about five years. So we're still in a, kind of a newcomer to the, the rating system um, um, kind of arena, uh, but the only one that's focused specifically on the waterfront and how waterfronts have kind of a, their own unique challenges and constraints compared to, to other types of land uses. Uh, we offer a, a professional's course um, with about that has currently 300 wedge um, certified professionals nationally. Those are a lot of folks in architecture and engineering firms, um, municipal governments, regulatory agencies, real estate developers and property owners, uh, people in the, the insurance and reinsurance industry. Um, port authority uh, type folks. Um, and at the, the end of this, we'll, we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that course. Um, we're also getting a lot of attention from different municipalities across the country who are using our guidelines to either help shape their, their own regulatory or, or building code systems or are requiring our verification as a requirement for projects that, that they have some control over. If we look at where our wedge professionals are, wedge started as a very New York, New Jersey centric um, system. And in 2019 was expanded to be applicable nationally. Um, so we've had uh, recently uh, a pretty significant focus um, from folks in Massachusetts and New Jersey and Florida. Um, and, and for uh, the next year or so, we're really focusing on growth in California, Texas, Florida and different parts of the, the East Coast. So what's in Wedge? So Wedge is a series of six different categories, each of which has a series of anywhere from four to 12 credits um, that have specific standards that we would look for a waterfront development to meet. So in our site assessment and planning um, category, we're gonna look at things like, did you do the requisite engineering studies uh, to identify you know, what are waves and currents and wakes gonna do at, at the facility? Did you, do, did you create a robust community or stakeholder engagement strategy and execute that well? Um, and I know that, that community engagement is, is a big part of the focus of this breakout. So I wanna make sure I touch on where the many, many places that engagement shows up in, this, in the system are. Um, that category zero is also going to look at things like, do you have a management and operations plan that's going to ensure that the, the facility stays in operation over the long term? Uh, category one looks at responsible siting and coastal risk, risk reduction. This is where a lot of the sea level rise um, resilience and adaptation strategies come in. So are you elevating properties? Are you, are you um, preparing for the 100 or even the 500 year storm accounting for sea level rise? Are you elevating critical assets, including dry or wet flood proofing into your building designs? Are you protecting against all the different coastal risks um, that you need to when you're building on the waterfront? 
And our, our category two is about community access and connections. And this is where we're looking to see if you're building kind of a great community access space that responds to the needs that were identified in your community engagement work. Um, so are you providing public access to the water? Are you connecting to the working waterfront? Um, are you providing transportation access, things of that nature? We have an edge resilience category, category three, that's looking at the types of edge that you're, you're working with. So are you stabilizing an edge that would actually have worked perfectly fine as a naturalized shoreline? Um, where you do have to do stabilization, are you doing things that allow um, either nature-based solutions or um, encourage other habitat or ecological um, enhancements. So things like e-concrete or um, you know, adjusting riprap so it's vegetated instead of just the rocks. Um, our natural resources category includes everything from are you using renewable energy and green infrastructure at the site to accommodating um, uh, enhanced stormwater systems and a number of other things around kind of vegetation, landscape, um, and different ways to, to incorporate better ecology and better habitats into the site. And then we have an innovation category that's for the, the sites that are doing something that kind of goes above and beyond uh, the requirements. So Wedge has, as I said, 10 verified projects across the country. Those span a lot of different land uses and that's in, in, intentional in the design of Wedge. So Wedge is, is basically designed to accommodate just about anything except for single family homes. Um, so a number of our wedge facilities are, or wedge verified facilities are park sites, um, but we also have um, different multifamily or mixed use developments. We've even got a couple um, um, industrial sites um, and our, our, our system is designed so that you know, we assess the, the facility based on the different constraints that different land use types have. Um, to talk a little bit about kind of how this plays out in an actual site development. Uh, I've got two examples that I can go through. Um, so the first is Oak Point McKinnis Cement. This is a cement import facility in the Bronx, New York. Um, this was a site that got hit really hard during Hurricane Sandy. Um, and in their rebuild, they raised the buildings out of the 2050 floodplain. Um, they installed wave attenuating breakwaters, restored wetlands, um, and actually opened up the site to public access for the first time in its history. It connects to a couple different greenways in the Bronx um, through a public walkway that's, that's now accessible. Another facility, um, this one's currently under construction, um, is North Waterfront Park in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, this is an example of where, you know, a, a really robust community driven design process changed the design of the park. Um, so the public access areas um, were really driven by what community members said they wanted in the design phase and the, the city and the, the architects behind this project really responded to that well. Um, the site also features some, some innovative stormwater drainage designs. Uh, it preserved um, wetlands and coastal plantings, provides direct access to the water. Um, and so this is one that, that we verified um, just earlier, earlier this year. Um, as I said at the beginning, we have our um, Wedge Professionals course coming up. We're offering it again in January 20th and uh, 21st of next year. Um, this is... Uh, will cover both the, the guidelines in, in much more depth than I just talked through. Um, and also we'll talk through kind of a, a series of case studies where we bring in different architects and landscape architects and engineers behind the projects to kind of go take us behind the scenes and show us how they applied specific credits in the web system to, um, uh, to the project. And we'll put the link to that in the chat and, and I believe it should be sent around um, following the conference as well. Um, I think that's all we have have time for. Um, you can contact me at the email address on the, the slide. Um, you can learn more about us at wedge.waterfrontalliance.org. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I'm just going to thanks so much. Um, that was terrific. So one of the really important issues uh, about this, all of this, and um, it really comes down to 
preserving also public access to uh, the waterfront, which we know that uh, we've gotten rid of a lot of public access to the waterfront, and also we've really diminished the working waterfront. So I think um, those are two priorities that we are always looking at um, with anything, and we're really glad that um, your wedge program is so focused on those. All right, um, so now, uh, moving back to our main presenter schedule, I'd now like to introduce David Walcott. David is a NOAA scientist, a physicist by training, who'll be talking with us about tides. And as you know, this is one of our favorite subjects here at U.S. Harbors. To call him a big data guy is a bit of an understatement. Uh, David translates the reams of amazing data NOAA and other scientists collect about the water and in the water and he transforms it into understandable and actionable tools and resources for communities and other stakeholders. We're looking forward to hear what David has to share on the current state of tide monitoring and also on the future of tidal predictions, as well as hearing his explanation for why many scientists do not very fond of the term king tides and what might be a better name for this phenomenon. Um, if you would like to ask David a question during his session, again, please raise your hand and we'll see if that works out. Otherwise, we'll be answering them afterwards if you put it in the Q&A. So welcome, David, and thank you. Hello. Um, <laughs> so let me try to uh, navigate this. Um, stand by. I think I got it. All right, can you see my screen? We can. Could you mind pressing that little button that says present there on the top right? Yep. Okay, uh, can, can you, you see, see it now? now? Yes, indeed. All right, so uh, Anastasia uh, put in the, the um, I suppose, the, the agenda that I will be talking about tight stuff. And um, no, I see a mention of an echo. Let me try to change that. Hang on. Is that any better? Um, David, is it possible to mute the microphone on your computer? Uh, we can't hear you now. Um, so um, I'm not sure which one you have dialed in on, but if you dialed in on your phone, um, you can mute the computer or if you're dialed in, otherwise you could mute the phone. Um, so sorry, so sorry, folks. We are working to resolve this issue um, right now with David. Um, so if you can just be patient for one or two min uh, one minute or two, we will um, see if we can resolve the um, the sound issue. And if not, we'll give him a little bit more time um, in a few minutes. Um, we can move uh, shortly to. Um, our present one of our presentations on a uh, tide stations actually why don't we do that while um, they're resolving the issue and um, I'm just going to um, jump into our next um, presentation which is uh, the first part of our uh, uh, the first part of our um, second breakout which is um, with about uh, the new technologies for tide stations so um, this is something we're super interested in. Um, and as you may know, we've been partnering with two companies that are gonna be presenting this afternoon um, to pilot and test their technologies as well as make them available to you and your community. So our first pilot projects, installing hyperlocal tide stations in five communities here in Penobscot Bay is in partnership with the cutting edge Boulder, uh, Colorado based company Divirod. And we have Heiko um, Utliff with us, uh, Divirod CTO, and he's gonna be telling us a bit about their technology. Um, if you have a question, just put it in the Q&A window. Hey, Heiko. You're gonna have to unmute yourself. You're all ready to, 
you, um, you're good to, um, to, to share. Sorry, it's a little sure. quicker than you expected, but. Sure, no worries, all good. Can you guys hear me though? Yes, you look, uh, you, everything looks good. Cool, and you guys can see my screen, I assume. Thank you very much. So as Anastasia just said, thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Heiko Utluft. I'm the CTO in Divirod. Divirod is a company that's working to help resiliency against water risks. We understand resiliency as the ability to adjust easily from an adversity or change that's happening to a system. So with, uh, with more severe climate events, uh, weather events happening, and with mm, sea level rise becoming more and more noticeable, we at Iberod believe that we can help uh, through data, hyperlocal data, as Anastasia just mentioned, to combat some of these some of these water risks that exist. And uh, in the next five minutes or so, I'm going to talk about how we actually do that and our joint project together with U.S. Harbors. So, what does Iberod actually do? As I said before, we enable resiliency against water risks through global hyperlocal data. It's a bit convoluted. So we have sensors, uh, proprietary sensor technology. It's a passive radar sensor, and I'll show it later. And we deploy them globally. So the sensor measures locally, but we are uh, bit by bit building up a global view, the most uh, comprehensive view. That's the goal of uh, water data currently that's there. We can measure with the same sensor a broad set of data types. So currently, we're measuring water levels and uh, for tides, rivers, as well as water reservoirs. But the same sensor is measuring precipitation. We're working towards soil moisture so that you could work towards, so that you could use towards erosion work and similar things. So there's many data types on the development. The solution scope is really broad that we're tackling. So we go from individuals that might have an issue with water to, to local installations, re regional installations like we did in Penobscot Bay, but we also support national and global efforts uh, with some of our partners. The data that we build, we deliver through services. So you can get raw data access to an API, API if you want, but we also have dashboards, alerts, reports. We offer an analytics platform and we're very excited about integrating our data with third-party solutions. So if you already are using Esri, for instance, the, one of the ArcGIS tools, uh, with just a few clicks, we can make data accessible to you um, for the stations that we already installed. And very important to mention is our business model is that we do data as a service. So we, we have sensors that need to get installed locally, but um, you don't have to pay for those. It's basically just an ongoing data subscription. So there's no CapEx on your books for that, basically. On the right-hand side, you see a little bit what that could look like. So this is, this is a sample dashboard with locations that we are installing on the River Rhine in Germany uh, to, to measure how flood is propagating there. And I'll show another one from Penobscot Bay in just a minute. Uh, I need to somehow find a way to show Zoom questions at the same time as I'm presenting. But Anastasia, if there's a question I should answer, just uh, please interrupt me briefly. Okay. We follow the, the model, let's say, don't model, just measure. So why do we say that? Our sensor enables to collect hyperlocal information. In the, in the area of Penobscot Bay, we were able to deploy five sensors uh, with gen, within just a few hours. All the data that we have is intercomparable because we measure with the same unit, the same data anywhere on the globe at the moment. So that makes our technology very, very scalable. Very important to mention also is that we have a high speed to action. So we can install a sensor within less than one hour and it takes about one week to have the data fully integrated with existing system. With all of that said, we don't see ourselves primarily as a competition to existing systems, but more to complement and augment monitoring systems that are already in place. One of the previous speakers mentioned that all of Maine has three NOAA gauging stations. But what we actually find is that the NOAA stations, um, the, the interpolations that you do from those NOAA stations don't necessarily accurately reflect the local tidal conditions. And that's what we're also seeing with the data that we're already collecting. So we integrate our data and complement NOAA data. We are integrating with digital twins with some of our partners. We can support hydrology models and validate hydrology models and many, many more use cases that we're starting to explore as we are ramping up our uh, sensor deployment. The technology, as I said before, is a passive radar technology. 
I could go into hours of details how it actually works, um, and I'm happy to do that at another time. We also have some YouTube videos available that explain it, but it's relative. It's 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 relatively easy to install. Um, you don't have to calibrate the sensor, and it's very robust because we measure multiple points simultaneously with this one sensing unit across a wide area, and uh, that allows us to take into account uh, disruptions that other technologies might be prone to. Tidal station networks is something that we are very excited about. We are currently deploying two tidal station networks. Uh, one is focused in and around uh, Florida, and the other one, as we mentioned earlier, is in Penobscot Bay in Maine. On the left-hand side, you see the five stations that we installed so far, and on the right-hand side, you see a screenshot of uh, a sample dashboard that we pull out of the data. Now, resiliency for me has a large element of, of time. So resiliency has short, medium, and there's short, medium, and long-term resiliency. Short-term resiliency is when a flood just occurs, you want to know where did it hit the hardest? Uh, is, my, is my infrastructure, my road, my home underwater, yes or no? Medium-term resiliency for me is what can we actually do exploring use cases? What can we actually do when a flood hits? Uh, are there any measures I can take to, to maybe ease the effects uh, of a local flooding? Um, we, have a, we have an example that we discussed uh, with, with one of the um, hosts in Penasco Bay, where they have a clubhouse that they might, uh, might have to raise um, for future reference, uh, for, for, for preventing floods in future. That's something that you can do once you collect data over a long period of time. And then the long-term effects, as we heard a lot about uh, sea level rise and, uh, and the effects thereof and how that is unfolding. We're building up a sensor network uh, that can measure these effects globally um, and long-term. Over time, we will be collecting years and years worth of data that gives a rich data repository for researchers, engineers, and decision makers to, to really combat the long-term effects um, of, of water-related risks. And it all starts with local tidal station networks, and that's why we're very excited to be working jointly with US harbors on deploying these in and around Maine. This is my closing slide, actually. I was asked to keep it short. Uh, it's really a call to action. We have uh, 300 plus people um, on this conference right now. And I think uh, everybody who is here agrees that helping resiliency for local communities is something very, very important. And water risk is something very real that we as, as citizens and people need to uh, learn how to better deal with. We as Diverot are aiming to deploy 100 locations per month starting in March next year. So we're ramping up our production and deployment. These will be tidal stations that can be installed at docks, harbors, and marinas. We are rolling out river gauges and we are measuring water levels in reservoirs. You see at, uh, in and around the screen a few pictures. So you see here a tidal station that is overlooking a reservoir in California. Uh, this one here is the sensor with the best view in our network uh, out uh, looking out in Venice. And as was mentioned as an area of high interest uh, to measure the relative movement between land and water. So that's what we're capturing here. You see here deployment in Florida, uh, an installment at a river, and here a bit zoomed in how a sensor installment could look like. And the sensor itself is just that little white unit on the top. We're also working on extending our partnerships. So if any of you on the call would be interested in, in working together and have some use cases in mind, uh, please reach out either directly to me uh, or through Anastasia. I'm sure she's happy to facilitate an introduction. And um, we're looking for partners that can help find use cases, find deployment opportunities, and, and really people that, that, that need more and better data and can work with those data. We're also looking for local support. So if you know somebody locally that could use or host a title station, feel free to reach out. And as I mentioned before, we're looking for relevant use cases to really help um, resiliency against water risks and we run the planet. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Heiko. I really appreciate it. Um, super, we've been thrilled to have our, our project with Divirod. It's It's been going incredibly well. We, we have been learning tons and it's it's been really grateful and we're really glad, um, thankful and grateful to you and Divirod for supporting that program. Um, and now I'm just going to uh, go to the other um, hyperlocal tide um, station solution uh, provider that we have. I'm hoping, um, yep, I see Nicole is on the line. Um, so last, but very not, uh, much not least, um, and we'll get back to David. We're, we're still working through some things, but we're going to get him on here. 
Um, we're thrilled to hear from Nicole, Dr. Nicole Elko. Um, she is the co-founder of Hohonu. And that's a Hawaii-based technology startup that was founded to provide communities with accessible environmental data to help them adapt to climate change. He has over 20 years of experience in coastal science and management and is assisting with many beach preservation projects along the U.S. Southeast and Gulf Coast. And among um, her other positions, Nicole is the science director for the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association. I mentioned them before. And if anybody has any beaches or um, shores that they are thinking about needing hardening, I highly recommend them as an organization um, for great resources. And she's an executive director of the US uh, Coastal Research Program. And she's presently serving as one of three civilian members on the US Army Corps of Engineers Coastal Engineering Research Board and is also a member of NOAA's Hydrographic Surfaces uh, Review board Panel. Um, welcome, Nicole. It's super nice to meet you. And I'm glad you're stepping in for your, um, for your uh, co-founder. Uh, co um, so um, welcome and um, go ahead, take it over. All right, thank you. I am uh, sharing my screen now. Can you let me know if that's working? Are you seeing the presentation? Yes, we are, but um, it, yes, perfect. It's a, is it in presenter mode rather than a standard mode for you? It is, it is, it's in presenter mode, thank you. Let me give you a quick redo on that and we'll see if I can fix that. How about now? Is that in uh, regular mode for you? Um, it is, but I have to remove. Uh, it's not. For some reason, it's taking over too much of the screen now. Let's see if I have. Um, okay. I actually um, pulled a bit of an audible on you, Anastasia, and I slipped in a few slides that are more in my wheelhouse. So the <laughs> presentation that you have isn't going to probably show what, uh, what, what we were trying to. Uh, it's going to give you Brian's talk rather than the one I was hoping to give you. So just give me just a second here to try to make this work for us. If you can. Yeah. And all of my technology is going awry. My <laughs> printer is now deciding to go. On it's the end of the day here on the East Coast. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Everything okay, going I think on. it's going to work this time. All right. There's my presentation, and we'll go into presenter. OK, looks good to you? Perfect. Wonderful. All right, thank you for tolerating that. Um, quick technology adjustment. My name is Nicole Elko, as Anastasia mentioned, and I am um, involved with Tahonu pretty much because I went to high school with Brian Glazer, and he came up with this great idea. Uh, he came to my uh, office one day. He lives in Hawaii now. I live in Charleston, South Carolina. We're both from Pittsburgh, and you know we were talking about some of the challenges that that I have working with the communities along the coastlines, particularly here in the southeast, that relate to flooding. Um, Brian is a wizard with um, technology and uh, he's a chemical oceanographer and they had developed a few sensors in their lab. Um, so I was encouraging him to um, in, 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 turn one of these sensors into a cheap tide gauge that we could um, use in the communities to help address some of the challenges. So I'll tell you a little bit about that story now and um, I'll do my best to walk you through a few of Brian's slides here. So the motivation slide, very similar to what we just heard, and I know what you've been hearing all day is that um, many communities around the world are dealing with climate change adaptation, and that has a lot to do with water. You know, in the world that I work in, um, beachfront communities, coastal communities, it used to be that beach and dune system was what they were worried about, bringing in the tourism, getting them to the beach, getting butts in the sand. And they have kind of solved that problem over the last 50 years. You know, beach erosion is, is, is a little bit more under control than it once was. And now they're dealing with water related challenges um, and, and, and shifting their gaze from the ocean front to, to, the, to the bay side, the back side, the marsh side of their islands where the water levels are, are coming up on them. 
So the challenge that we have in uh, water level monitoring is that the uh, equipment historically has been complex and expensive. That's sort of a schematic of a traditional NOAA tide gauge. And you know, they're, since they're expensive and, and, and resource intensive, there aren't that many of them. Um, so the solution that Hohonu is proposing is um, much smaller, cheaper, easy to deploy sensors and kind of to put them everywhere. Um, the com company has gained quite a bit of traction in, by partnering with NOAA, local governments, NGOs, to deploy a sensor network. So I'm working in the part you see here highlighted in the southeast. The company is working with multiple divisions of NOAA across 14 states and over 60 municipalities. Um, the project I'll tell you about now is one that we're working on with Socora, which is um, part of NOAA, part of the Integrated Ocean Observing System. It's their regional association here in the southeast. And what we're doing is um, we're working with Socora to install these low cost water level sensors across the southeast to help communities with those coastal flooding challenges. So the project's already providing real time water level data, tide predictions and flooding alerts to coastal communities. Um, we're seeking funding and excited to work with U.S. Harbors to expand this project on a, on a larger scale across the U.S. and beyond. Um, so what you see on the map here are the, the blue pins or the NOAA tide sensors that were kind of depicted on that previous graphic. The purple pins, the darker ones, are all of the sensors that have been installed with this project. So you can see that we're achieving one of the objectives of the project, which is to really increase the spatial density of water level measurements across the region. Um, the way that this project got started was here in the Southeast. I was talking with the board of directors I work with in South Carolina. So basically the mayors and administrators of all these beachfront communities up and down the coast. And we just gone through a, a, a King Tide event, right? That's what they call them. And um, they, it, it happened to hit in the middle of the night and the mayors were saying, gosh, I was up last night because I was literally worried that the town was flooding, but I had no data, right? I had to get up and look out the window to see if our town was going underwater. And in today's age, shouldn't I be able to look at my cell phone, know that we're fine and go back to sleep? So it's been a fun project because the mayor sort of designed this decision support tool. They asked us for, for exactly this product. Um, we've been able to install the water level sensors that you see pictured here in the bottom right across the region. The, the uh, mobile application is under development, but the data are being served through a website. So I encourage you to go to the website you see at the bottom there, hohonu.io. By the way, hohonu, the name of the company means deep in Hawaiian. And um, you can sign up for a free account. It takes about 10 seconds, and then you would have access to this dashboard to explore some of the water level data. There are four teams working on this project in the Southeast, and um, ASBPA is one of the four. And we're, the, the spatial density that you saw in that map will actually increase a lot more over the next five years. So we're really excited about that. Just an example of all the communities have already had sensors installed across North Carolina alone. And then um, just some examples of what the data look like. So we do survey these sensors in um, with RTK GPS. We, we uh, we're getting some high accuracy measurements um, so that the data are reported relative to NAVD88 in the beginning um, after about 30 days that we're able to serve the data relative to mean low or low water. So that's what the communities are used to seeing. And then we kind of update those, those um, local datums over time. We resurvey the stations annually and um, ensure some pretty high quality data. It's not uh, the level of the NOAA stations, but that's not really the, the objective here. The objective is to provide communities with more information than they have, right? And that is um, an example that you're looking at here. So this is Isle of Palms in South Carolina, just outside of Charleston, where I sit. And um, the water level data you see there peaking on November 3rd, right in the middle of your screen, and it's getting up into that critical elevation caution band. So in addition to surveying the elevation of the water level sensors so we can measure the tides, we survey things that are important to a community, right? The elevation of the causeway the ferry dock landings, the things that are in, in, in critical for bringing um, uh, visitors and, and business and just getting the residents on and off the island, keeping life functioning, because when, when those things start to flood, that's when the communities have significant problems. 
And the goal of this project, we're just getting started at sort of providing these decision point pieces to them. Um, the goal of the project is to, to you know, be able to provide that decision support for the community so that their emergency managers know three days out that they're probably going to be dealing with needing to close, you know, Bay Street because it's going to flood or, or the things that they need to prepare for. Um, I was also talking with the National Weather Service office here in Charleston just about an hour ago. And, you know, we're talking about sharing the data through our API so that they can um, verify and quality check some of the predictions and forecasts that they're providing. So it's a really exciting project for us to be involved in. And um, I can talk about this for a really long time, but I'm probably getting, getting near on time and I'll, I'll wrap up there and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was really, really great. I appreciate you stepping in for Brian at the last minute. I know he had a meeting that he could not get out of at that last minute. And um, we are really, really excited to be working with you on our upcoming installation in Portland, Maine to support the city of Portland um, at the GRMI, uh, GMRI um, waterfront. So, and then expanding into um, the public marinas in New York City and San Francisco. So exciting. <laughs> All right, so and now we're going to try to get back to David and see if we can get this King Tide thing answered, David. <laughs> um, are you able to, uh, I'm going to unmute you, or I, I'm going to ask you to unmute, or dial in, whichever you figured out might work. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, indeed. And you sound better. All right. Fantastic. All right. I apologize for that. That was a, um, I, I feel a little bit better, better that Nicole had some technical problems because. Um, yeah, we asked her to. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Um, it's the end of the day here on the East Coast. So uh, we're getting tired here, but yeah, take it away. All right, so um, just to kind of set the stage, uh, you know, I, I chuckled myself a number of times because I really think that, you know, that the other panelists uh, kind of did my job for me. Um, so as a matter of fact, uh, just a couple of minutes ago, I deleted some slides because Renee actually covered them. Um, so, Anastasia, you know, in the in the agenda, she she said David's going to talk about tide stuff. So let's talk about tide stuff. Um, I want to keep this very informal. Um, if you have a question, throw it in. I'll try to answer it um, in real time. But if if not, you know, we will certainly get back to those questions after the fact. But uh, to start with, um, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, there's a quote that I, I like a lot, and that today's flood is tomorrow's high tide. And I attribute this to the late Margaret Davidson. Um, but if anyone out there um, actually knows if she did not, you know, coin that term, uh, let me know. Um, and I'll attribute this to them. But I think it's a pretty good one. I, what we're talking about today, the whole the whole presentation has been really fantastic. Um, and so I'd like to, you know, John talked about the the realization of climate change, and Renee talked about the implementation parts. Um, and so I kind of wanted to focus on um, what what products are available that people can use? Um, and then maybe, you know, where are we going with, with, the, um, with the sea level, um, you know, uh, well, products, right? So there are a couple of things that, <laughs> that uh, terminology I think is pretty important because what we speak um, is not necessarily what you know the the media or what what you know people on Main Street speak 
And so I wanted to try to clarify a couple of things. So sea level trends, model forecasts, high predictions, high tide flooding outlooks, right? So these are all forward looking ideas, um, but they're all distinctly different. Um, and I want to clarify what those differences are. Um, also want to mention, you know, what the, uh, the, the, um, what m my office does and where we came from and what we're doing now. Um, but then also, you know, what are we doing with the data that we're collecting? Um, so relative sea level trends, you know, John, both John and Renee, you know, um, mentioned this, but the concept of sea level rise, um, you know, it's not new. This is this is something that people have been talking about for a, a very long time. Um, what we can present from NOAA, and we get this data not only from NOAA stations, but also from stations all across the world. Um, we can take those and compare the sea level motion relative to land, and that turns into a relative sea level trend. Um, you know, th there's a difference between global sea level rise um, and then the relative sea level rise. And the reason that's important is because individual communities probably care more about what's happening in their actual community than what the global average is. You know, whether it, if it's, you know, three centimeters, or sorry, three millimeters per, per year, on average, well, that might not mean as much as if, you know, the land is subsiding in the local community and that's pushing the relative sea level rise up to a centimeter a year. You know, Renee talked about the the Gulf and, you know, that's, that's a great example. Uh, Charleston, poster child for this type of thing. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, this is a pretty important distinction between absolute global sea level rise versus localized relative sea level rise. So just, you know, a little bit of terminology there. Um, we also have these operational forecast systems um, that can, that can produce, um, you know, um, forecast up to okay sorry just saw your your note that's fine I can I can breeze through this but um, uh, so we we basically take a hydrodynamic model and then apply you know the observations to the um, predictions um in one fell swoop right and from that we can get up to five days uh of forecast okay so we've got sea level trends that's a you know future projection we've got operational forecast systems which are short term um high predictions on the other hand um are mathematically derived um you know, the, it's it's strictly taking the basically what we do is we take the water level time series and then we decompose that into the different components of cycles based on the positions of the sun, the moon, the earth, and then we sum that together, and that's what you that's that's what we call a tie prediction. Um, High predictions have no climatology associated with them um, in that term tide prediction that we use. Um, you, we can take that information and say, what's the tide prediction going to be two days from now? What's that tide prediction going to be 10,000 years from now? Um, but it's completely decoupled from any sort of climate or sea level rise scenarios. Um, so by themselves, tide predictions, if 
you know, if I use my my forefinger as the high tide for one day and my thumb as the low tide for one day, those will travel up and down as sea levels go. So there's nothing nothing inherently um, climactic about high predictions. But there are, you know, there are the, there are a couple of considerations around these, right? So tide predictions have been around for a very, very long time. Um, our procedures have certainly improved over the past couple hundred years, but, you know, even back a thousand years ago, um, people were predicting the tide and they were mostly interested in when is it going to happen? Um, and so even, you know, the I use the example of the Changchang River, um, you know, the first known tide prediction that I know about was from 1056, which is pretty incredible. Um, we've certainly changed our approaches, but we have lots of, lots of historical data that we can build upon. Um, so for instance, I put here, you know, we have 3,500 tide prediction locations, uh, 1,200 are derived from modern methods. And then, you know, for where mariners, we also have uh, 2,500 tidal current predict prediction locations. Um, and the difference between the modern and historical approaches are historical approaches are very rough range and phase corrections that would be applied to a nearby reference station. Um, <clears throat> more modernly, we use either a Fourier transform or elite squares, harmonic analysis, like the, the math, math doesn't matter, but we, we try to capture the influences of those different <clears throat> Um, uh, those different astronomical influences. Um, and that's what we use for a tie prediction. I don't know if that's clear as mud, but, um, but then, but then the question becomes, wait, I, you know, I look at a tie prediction online and I see, you know, it's only supposed to be two feet or something like that. And you realize that you're, street is flooding. And so this is where, and this has been mentioned a couple of times, you know, the term king tide really doesn't mean anything. It's a, it's a, I don't know, it's, a, it's kind of a made up word, but what it, I think most people, and I want to be respectful for the use of it because a lot of people use it. Um, so it basically means bigger than normal tides, um, and that's higher than high uh, typical tides or lower than low typical tides. And <clears throat> it could mean, you know, it could mean a, a lot of number of things, but I think what it probably most relates to is this phenomenon of the perigean spring tide. And perigee and spring tide is a combination of two different things. Uh, perigee uh, refers to when, you know, the moon is closest to the earth in its orbit. And then spring tide are those places where the sun, the moon, and the earth are all kind of in alignment. And the gravitational forces that cause tides are are maximized. So I think perigee and spring tide is, is probably the more scientific way to describe king tides, but um, I also don't want to um, suggest that the term king tides is, you know, not not appropriate. I think king tides basically just mean when when the tides are biggest. The perigee and spring tides we can predict that's known we can we can solve for those cycles and we can we can predict when those are going to happen and so that leads into you know the other concept of 
well, what if it's not just tides? What if we're talking about, you know, meteorological influences or seasonal um, seasonal cycles or changes in, you know, in the in the Gulf Stream transport and so forth, um, or INSO, if we're talking about El Nino, you know, all of those things can play a contribution into into what the what the tides are, and I'm using air quotes, um, because what we're really talking about is the difference between water levels and tides. Water levels are what is actually happening on the surface, whereas tides is the predictable um, component. And some of those other contributions we can predict, um, just maybe not uh, with a great amount of certainty. Um, so, what does my what does my office do? Um, the National Water Level Observation Network, um, my office, tidesandcurrents.noaa, uh, tidesandcurrents.noaa.gov. Um, we have 210 permanent permanent tide stations uh, in both coastal locations and in the Great Lakes. Um, and most of this is for, you know, for the sake of commerce, right? So we want to mon monitor and observe water levels uh, so that there's safe commerce uh, for, you know, ships coming in. Um, this was started 18 and 1807. Thomas Jefferson said, you know, an act to dot, 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 dot. And then, you know, we've had continuous water level monitoring monitoring since the 1850s, which is pretty uh, pretty cool. San Francisco, that's our longest running station. We have products that go all the way back, you know, uh, to that point, and we have continuous uh, derived products. <clears throat> and so over the years, um, the act that Thomas Jefferson signed, you know, NOAA has evolved, you know, used to be that that hydrographers out on the uh, out on the water with with a boat trying to figure out the depth, um, oceanographers trying to figure out what the tides are doing, and geodesists uh, working on the land trying to figure out how the land and the water uh, relate to each other. That used to be one organization, and then it kind of split up into three within the National Ocean Service. And so now we have <clears throat> my office co-ops. We have the National Geodetic Survey, and we have the Office of Coast Survey. Um, <clears throat> the stuff that we're doing now, our technology is certainly much better, but the principles are essentially the same. Um, so, you know, this is just a, a quick overview of you know where we've where we've come. You know, in the early 1800s, you know, you had some guy reading a tide staff, and then now we have microwave sensors and, and you know, you know, redundant systems and satellite uh, telemetry and so forth. Um, but the, but the, the principles are, are not that different. So in the past, we would use simple technologies I, this is a joke, you know, some guy named Joe out on a pier reading a tide staff and writing it down. Um, and now each one of those stations that I mentioned incorporates a multitude of, of really, really robust um, technology, which is pretty cool. So what does that mean? What, what's the difference? Uh, so in the past, it was simply to make a nautical chart. Um, and surveying the coast. And now we're looking at um, data that could be applied to a bunch of different coastal observation areas, you know, areas where, you know, you would need to make uh, decisions. So what, is, what does that mean? What are we doing with all of that data, right? So we're sitting on a, a treasure trove of, of data um, what do we do with it? Um, and I would like to say that 
So my office co-ops is not the only ones that are that are doing this, right? Um, there are certainly other parts of, of NOAA. The Office of Coastal Management produces some exceptionally great products for making coastal decisions, but there are, there, there are tons of other federal agencies that are doing this. The academia is doing this. Uh, you you know saw the presentation about the hyper local um, uh, technologies. Like everyone is looking at at doing the same type of thing. But I just wanted to highlight a couple of really what I think would be impactful um, impactful products that that you know, Renee already uh, touched on a couple of these, so that's why I re removed those slides. But um, let me just mention a couple of these. Coastal Inundation Dashboard, the High Tide Flooding Bulletin, and then our Global and Regional Sea Level Rise Scenarios uh, documents. It's important to note that all of these are going to change. Like, this is totally evolving, but this these are you know, some really uh, hopefully useful useful tools. So what is the the CID? Um, you know, it's a, it's a map. It's basically a GIS map. And, um, you know, you can look at uh, flooding statistics at different locations. You can see where different locations might be experiencing flooding based on those statistics. Um, uh, everything is everything is kind of compacted into one central location. Um, so they're in the historically uh, local national weather service uh, forecast offices would establish um, um, flooding criteria for their location. Um, and that is embedded in the um, in the coastal inundation dashboard. Um, <clears throat> but there's also coastal storm uh, flooding and washes that are are part of the product that are flagged automatically. This is you know this, as soon as a water level, whether it's from a prediction, from a a forecast model, um, or from an observation, if any of those breach one of those flooding forecast um, uh, thresholds, then a flag is thrown, and you can get an alert um, based on the the location. <clears throat> Did I just breathe? No. I can. Okay. Yep. Looks good. Um, so, so like I said, um, the local flood impact thresholds that the Weather Service um, establish are, you know, are one thing. But then we've also built into the CID, all of these other different products, um, and you can you can access this. Um, I I don't have a link to it. Maybe um, maybe Alicia, you can you can add a, a, a link to the chat uh, that shows where you can add the uh, the CID. But um, there, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no worries. I appreciate that. Uh, so there are within this tool, there are a number of products that that I think would be impactful for coastal um, coastal planners. So the inundation history is is number one. You can see when and where, um, and by how much um, water levels have exceeded those certain thresholds. Um, we've got the real-time data that's, you know, based on both observations, predictions, and models. 
We've got yearly inundation events, um, top 10 water levels. And to be clear, the top 10 water levels are, you know, are, are, are the top six minute data point that is removed from, or that can be attributed to a specific event, right? So like Hurricane Sandy, for instance, you know, if you looked at New York, right, if you were to look at the top 10 six minute water levels, they would all be in one curve around the, the height of the event. So these are, are separate events. Um, and the, the highest water levels that can be attributed to each one of those. Um, and there's the sea level trends and then exceedance probabilities. Okay. Um, you know, we are so over time. I'm gonna kind of skip through these, but please take a look at the uh, at the at the slides and you know shoot me an email if you have questions. Um, and David, we it's okay for us to share your slides with the group here. Yes, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Great. Um, and this, I think, I think Renee might have mentioned this. Um, this is a, a tool that came out of the Office of Coastal Management, um, the Sea Level Rise Viewer. It's embedded within the CID, and so if you want to take a look at what two feet, three feet five feet over um, <clears throat> over mean high or higher water would look like in any location, you, you can do it. It's a pretty cool tool. Um, the high tide flooding bulletin. Uh, this is where we talk about the perigee and spring tide again. And we say, when is this gonna happen? Um, each one of these, you know, you can, you can take a look at the, the seasonal bulletin, but also look at your specific region. Um, and, and by so, the for way, instance, I, I want to say quickly that at U.S. Harbors, if you're on our mailing list, we do send out monthly mailings with these dates ahead of time, so you can get them. Um, we're we're sending this out. We've been doing this for a couple of years, so I I think that's awesome. Um, and you know, the outreach is is something that uh, that we are going to work on. Well, we are actively trying to get better at, um, but yes, that's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. So yeah, uh, so the high tide bulletin, you know, this is for the Northeast, Maine, New Hampshire, Mass, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, um, you know, October 6th through 11th. And if you look over uh, why will it be higher than normal? Then you know you've got some explanation. So I think this is a pretty cool. It's a pretty cool tool. Um, there's also every single year we kind of take that approach and we build it into a a document that says what's coming up for the next year. Um, you know, it's not. Again, this is not um, necessarily sea level rise. It's what are we looking at for high tides for the coming year? Um, so you can you can take a look at these documents. That, like I said, they come out uh, just about every year. Um, um, they're you know descriptions of of the trends. Um, the variability due to, you know, large scale cycles like ENSO, um, and what to what to what to expect. Um, and I'm we're so over time. I'm going to kind of skip through these, uh, but very quickly. But these projections that we're talking about, where we look into the future. And we say, you know, what is what what are the impacts of sea level rise on high tide flooding? Um, that's not that's not solely us, right? So that's a very interagency approach to um, to the science, and it's it you know it's fantastic. You know, we're utilizing 
satellite altimetry to uh, to incorporate with our tide gauge observations, and then you know utilizing information from all sorts of different agencies um, to try to figure out each year what 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 the what the impact is going to be. I I think I think the um, I really just want to say that you know this is not done in a vacuum and it's not done by one group. This is not um, you know we we all are playing in the same waters, so to speak. Um, where are we going? Sea level rise scenarios. Um, this was a uh, you know a paper that Renee referenced uh, from you know, from a number of, of colleagues um, in the National Ocean Service, uh, namely Billy Sweet, um, who put this out. And uh, we're gonna take this and derive more improved gridded scenarios so that individual point observations are not the only way to figure out what sea level is gonna do. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, if David, it doesn't, can you, you know, we can. Can you just tell people what gridded means? Because that has been one um, question that people have a asked about this terminology. Yeah, so it, it's basically taking <clears throat> it's basically taking a number. You've got point observations. You've got uh, satellite altimetry data. And then you overlay it on a one degree gridded map, essentially. It's it's applying it's applying those data onto. I don't want to say an interpolated surface. I would call it a model surface. Is that any clear clear as mud? <laughs> well, it's great. Um, it. I think we're getting the general idea, and I'm sure we'll have questions in the future. So, oh, uh, please, you know, send me all the questions you want, and I will, I will um, uh, happily pass them on to Renee Colini. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to finish this up. This is my last slide. Um, if you know the question of what can you do. What what can you do? Um, so I started my career analyzing data from tide gauges, and I don't think I'm going to end my career doing that. I think the future is a combination of models and satellites, right? So it, and I I'm not trying to discourage anyone, you know, from from going down this path by any means, but I don't think the idea of installing a tide gauge for 30 years to get a sea level trend is really practical anymore. Um, just given the just given the uncertainties associated with each one of those products. Um, so I think in situ observations are incredibly important for shorter term. Um, hazard monitoring, um, you know, things like, uh, you know, tsunamis, we definitely need very short term. We need, you know, quick, high precision information around that. Um, we, certainly storms, right? So you could monitor storms, but I, I just want to be careful with, with, suggesting that people go down the road of investing all the time and and money to keep something in for 30 years with the expectation of th that they will get a trend that is more meaningful than the new products that we are deriving and by we I don't just mean no I mean like we the broader community um, Anyway, uh, I would say that one of the best things that you could do, one of the things that would be most impactful would be 
your geodetics, right? So getting getting ties to um, the geodetic net network <clears throat> through um, GNSS, um, something like that. That that would be that would be super helpful, and that's something that we would want to ingest and we'll make use of. Can you, to, um, quickly, David, can you explain what that means, that last statement? Getting tied to the G, G and it, what is it, G? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I used an acronym and I didn't, I didn't <laughs> explain it. Um, right, so basically take GPS observations on coastal locations, right? So. Uh, take you know take a um, take a GPS receiver and put it on land right next to where your community is right next to a tie gauge right next to whatever and then feed that information into uh, to NOAA. I think that would be the most most impactful. Uh, great. So we have a couple of questions from the audience, so I'm going to allow them to talk. Um, the first one is from John Beal. John, I'm allowing you to talk. Can you, um, can, let's see, I'm going to ask you to unmute. All right, is Sue, um, I'm going to ask you to unmute if you can hear me. Okay, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Um, just a question, the idea of relying on models and uh, satellite information. One of the things we're doing in Belfast is we are doing observations um, in order to ground truth uh, NOAA um, predictions. We're doing this in specific cooperation with the Gray Office because they want to see if what they predict for floods um, actually uh, occurs. And so I'm just wondering whether or not you don't always want to have local ground truthing. Yeah, ground truthing um, as a term, I suppose, is could be a little bit confusing. Um, but th yes, the the term that I would use would be parameters. Um, as as these as these projected models evolve, we will need we will need, I suppose, ground truth. Right. Um, we're going to need some sort of boundary conditions that would say that what the models are showing is is true. There's nothing wrong with that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, and now maybe um, Heidi Brown, you had a question. I'm just going to ask you to unmute. Heidi, are you able to unmute? Um, I don't see you being able to unmute. If you are un unable to unmute, um, you could write your question in the um, Q and A, and that would be great. Um, so there was other one other question. Um, so uh, the the question was, um, David, was there are some discrepancies being seen from the tidal predictions and the tidal observations and um, on several stations here in Maine that we know about. And we're wondering if you are seeing those discrepancies in other um, of your observational stations around the country. Yes, absolutely. And can you account for why you're seeing those discrepancies? Right, so they're, they're uh, yeah, I don't, I don't wanna, get too far down the technical rabbit hole, but there are a number of reasons why we would see that. Um, one is that tidal datum, the control, the concept of a controlled tidal datum is based on a 19 year average. Um, and in places where, you know, where you see, you know, large subsidence rates or, 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 you know, any sort of uh, rapid sea level change event, the observations that deviate from that mean um, will be apparent in the difference between observations and predictions. 
Um, so that is certainly not uncommon. I don't know if that if if that's clear, but um, does that help? <laughs> and, and that's and that's due to the 19-year tidal datums um, chain differences. Is that what the differences in those 19 years? Yeah, I mean it's 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 kind of based on the idea that you know use a 19-year average, but over that time period, you know things are are tilting, and so that the midpoint of that 19-year average is no longer necessarily representative of of truth. Um, the truth is in the observation, not that average. But that average is used because it's a benchmark standard against which we can compare all locations. Does that help? Yes, it does. And, um, and also, we understand that you guys are updating those datums, those 19-year datums. So can you just give us a quick overview of that? Uh, yes, we are, and that's the uh, yes, and it's causing a lot of headaches for a lot of my my colleagues. But I would imagine that update will be released in 2025, I suppose. Wow! So we we have quite a ways to um, still rely on the current datums for the uh, for the projections you guys are doing. Well, you do for yes. You do for the title datums, but I, again, there are these other products and and tools out there that we're trying to, you know, get out the door that would be more up to date. But again, that's really that 19 year period is just a, it's like the common currency that we can use to talk about all different locations. Great. Well, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more questions coming down the road um, for you about this, and we'll probably have quite a bit of follow up. Um, I know both from the people who are as interested in deep data as you are uh, to those of us who really don't understand it, but um, still want to know what's going on. Um, <laughs> um, so thank you so much, David. I'm really glad that um, your presentation worked out. And um, and we're really at the end of our conference today, and it's been such a pleasure to ha have all of our presenters here. We want to give a huge thank you out to our presenters today, all of whom who have donated their time, expertise, passion, and dedication to share with you this really important information for the future of our coasts. And we really are grateful to them for all the work that they're doing to help us move forward in this changing world. We are going to do our best to make um, available all the resources that we've heard about today and even more on our website, um, usharbors.com. We have a special microsite we're developing. Um, it's usharbors.com slash coastal dash waters. And, um, we'll, and also we'll be putting up a form shortly there where if you want to request a hyperlocal tide station for um, doing observations in your area, you can sign up for that. One thing about um, the tide stations that even though on a technical basis, they have um, some short term use cases and some longer term use cases. One thing that um, people tend to underestimate is the impact that they have on the, the actual community and the people in that community and even the students that are able to see this data and access this data and understand that they own it and it's their place. There's a, a real importance to sense of place and belonging and sense of responsibility and engagement with your place. Um, so, uh, we hope that our event today has given you all some great food for thought, or better yet, a sense of how to think about and move forward with this developing plans for resilience in the face of the uncertainties ahead for our coastal communities. And um, just an FYI that we will be sending out um, a couple of post-conference emails. One is a survey about the conference and what you found most interesting. Your responses are really highly appreciated, and they'll help inform our future efforts in this space. And the other thing we'll be sending out is a compendium of all the user submitted questions with answers from our presenters that may take us a few days because we still have to circle back with the presenters and we'll send that under another, another cover. And I'm speaking for myself, Alicia and the rest of our very small team here at US Harbors when saying that we're endlessly grateful for your support of our work in providing coastal and water level data to keep you, your business and your community safe and prosperous. The mission here at U.S. Harbors is to promote sustainability and resilience of coastal communities, both economically and environmentally. And we are so honored to have been able to pull this event together for you all. 
Um, we wish you all a really wonderful rest of your day, wherever you may be. And please remember to keep in touch. There is so much more to come. So goodbye for now. Thank you all again um, and take care. Um, have a great night. <laughs>